thank being you. here early on a snowy morning. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It was, yeah. it was a challenging drive. I'm sure it's <laughs> not the worst, but <laughs> challenging. Uh, thank you for having us. I'm Jane Kennedy with J.B. Kennedy Associates, which is a sole proprietor lobbying firm. Um, I'm, I'm based out of Williston, Vermont, and I'm here today for T-Mobile on H94 and H145. I can give you back a lot of the time you just lost up in your last few minutes because these are, um, I'll, I'll speak to each bill. I'll start with H94, um, simply because that's the order they go in. Uh, I don't want to sound harsh, but T-Mobile, as this is a tax, and T-Mobile does not support uh, an increase in the tax for this particular use. It feels it doesn't broadly cover all uh, the entire customer base in Vermont, and it's a tax on Vermonters. I, we're we're not saying that it's tax on us that we wouldn't it wouldn't be passed on, but I think it, the best, the simplest response I can give you on that bill is that. We don't support it. We understand it. We, if we don't have a suggestion for where you would get the money, we understand the need for money in this area, but if we would suggest that this is not the place yeah. uh, to get it. So that's our comment on that one. On H145, um, we do support that bill um, because it does uh, expand that provider, that, that tax to providers who aren't uh, beyond us who are selling our services. Uh, you know, we don't, T-Mobile doesn't have any stores yet in Vermont, so how we sell stuff is a little bit different in Vermont, but it, we, we see this tax as, as being um, leveling the playing field to, F, to everyone who's uh, this uh, fee, leveling the playing field to everybody who's uh, selling telecommunication services. So we, T-Mobile supports it happily. That, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, so T-Mobile doesn't have stores, but you do sell cards. Yeah, well, they are sell the, yeah, and they're sold, they're not, and they're sold in stores around. I don't know how many, I, w I was going to try and look. I know in a couple stores I went into this weekend, I saw them. We don't know how many, uh, the woman I work with, uh, who does want to come up here in March sometime, by the way, to talk with you people, Stacy Briggs. Um, we don't know, but we believe they should be uh, paying the tax too, just as we do when you, if you buy directly through us. And a lot of our sales are with prepaid cards. You get your phone, and then you do a prepaid plan. You pay a month ahead. There are some sales um, of our service that are a month behind, and then you, on your billing, as I'm told, you see uh, the tax and the fees. If you're paying ahead, you pay a set fee. It's forty dollars right now, I believe, for one line and the fees and taxes are included in that $40. So in that case, T-Mobile just pays the tax? We pay, yes, well, or, customer pays it, it's okay. built into the, it's built into the, what the customer pays. That means it's not separated. Out. It's not separate, it's not unbundled. Yeah. Just to clarify, uh, one, uh, 94, you're calling that a tax, and, and on 145, you. you're calling that a fee. Well, I think that's the way they're referred to. I'm not sure. I may be wrong. But they're both. Okay. USF fee, yes. you know, has been in existence and it has it set out purposes as that. I, I meant to pull it up yes. this morning, but you saw it all last week. Um, and designated uses. And part of our problem with that is that we believe it goes up beyond those designated uses and not the use that it's helpful to the broad base of people, consumers. Okay? Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Yep. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Chris, do you want to go? Sure. Sure. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Chris Rice. I'm a lawyer, lobbyist here in Montpelier from MMR here on behalf of Verizon. Um, I was asked to come and talk with you about 145. I didn't prepare comments for 94, but I can share with you uh, some perspective on that. Um, as John said, uh, Verizon's in a similar position relative to H145. We think it's a cleaner way to um, collect uh, the uh, the fee tax 
I'm not going to get hung up on which word you use. It's, it's a charge um, for those uh, point of sale. That would bring Vermont in line with the overwhelming majority of states that assess uh, the charge on prepaid services. Um, we think it's a much cleaner, transparent, effective way to do it. Um, so unless there are any questions on that, I'll jump back to H94. Um, that's not something historically that Verizon has supported. In fact, it's something historically that Verizon has opposed. Um, that being said, we know what um, the level of importance that the legislature and the state of Vermont has placed on increasing connectivity throughout the state. Um, there is a relationship between the two bills, obviously. I think if um, you chose to deal with the point of sale uh, issue and brought it in line with how other states do it, uh, the increase in the universal service fund charge uh, would certainly be less objectionable from their perspective. I think there's there's room to talk about the connection between the two, uh, and I think get to a, a point where uh, the company would be comfortable. Um, so I'm assuming that that uh, Verizon historically has opposed the, the tax because it raises the cost of doing business. Sure. Um, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming check, just checking that. Sure. Um, but if it raises the cost of business for everybody in that business uniformly, is that there's no competitive disadvantage to an increase, correct? Well, I, I, and, I, and again, this goes back to historically that money has been, the funds out of Universal Service Fund has gone to uh, recipients that are not necessarily Verizon wireless customers uh, or to fund um, their infrastructure the same way it has been used uh, historically for other providers. So could that change down the road? Sure. Um, but that's, I mean, that's that's more of a historical perspective um, than what we might be looking at down the road. Any other questions for Chris? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Um, this, uh, part of this is about getting out more broadband coverage to rural areas. Does Verizon have a position on um, whether they would be interested in providing that service to the rural areas, or is the uh, e economics just not there for them, regardless well, of USF? And I, and I think that's that's always a challenge, right? Is being able to do it in a way uh, that is sustainable and viable. And I think you know, the, the, our experience with Coverage Co. is a great example of when you try and make something work. Um, and it's really, really challenging. Um, they have deployed and will continue to expand their deployment where they can make the business case uh, to do it. I think your question may be going more towards are there other opportunities for public-private partnership? Is that... Well, you had mentioned that the uh, Verizon is an historically a recipient of any of the USF funds um, because a lot of that sure. is angled towards obviously 911 but sure. also sure. the rural broadband sure. initiative yeah. and one of the technologies that could help resolve the rural broadband challenge is <coughs> high speed reliable wireless that gets into the nooks and crannies of the state. Yep. It's funny, it's funny, it's funny you ask. <laughs> I had a similar question uh, about a week ago. Um, I've talked with a company, again, historically, um, that's not been something that the company has been excited about. Um, I think they are increasingly open to that. Um, and where that goes, they have a couple of uh, initiatives underway in other states. Uh, and I think they want to see how those projects proceed. 
but there is, I think, an increasing appetite and a, a growing uh, willingness to explore those possibilities. I'm, I'm being vague because that's that's as much as I have. I wish I could give you something more specific. I'm sorry. Sure. So, and I'm hearing where you're at, um, but just wanting to maybe ask for some follow up. Sure. Um, you know, this proposal is looking to help um, improve the business case, really, sure. uh, in the yep. um, areas where it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if this type of proposal does not work for our existing carriers, is there some other way that the state can help improve the business case in the unserved areas that makes more sense? That's a great question. Um, and what I, I'll ask, and I think what I expect to get back is information relating to where they have gone, um, more of this public-private partnership and other jurisdictions, get more details on what that looks like and how that um, makes more sense from their perspective. All ears. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Um, to dive back into the vague world that you were discussing with yep. Representative Chase, um, you know, in, in my particular case, I have a Verizon cell phone mm -hmm. yep. and no service at home, so okay. I use wipe. Okay. So, um, it is, I mean, it, in the blurring of these lines, broadband build out helps with my cellular service. Sure. So, even if Verizon isn't the recipient of funds building out in underserved areas still potentially it's, it's there a, is a benefit, a benefit certainly you know. certainly totally get that okay. yeah. and so I guess that was more of a statement I don't know if you have a comment no, on it or no I, th I think I think yeah. it's to me it's it's we're getting to the point where uh, it's a bit of an ecosystem as we rise that level um, for individual services that, that has spin-off benefits for others. There's no question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. All right. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Committee. Um, Chuck Storo, Lee Nine Public Affairs, um, <clears throat> on behalf of AT&T. I was here, I think it was last Friday, speaking to H145, which we do strongly support. And I showed you the Public Utilities Commission's uh, order that directs the, uh, the cell phone carriers to basically send in what they think they owe on the prepaid uh, calling plans, the USF fee on the prepaid calling plans. Um, I did a little back of the envelope math showing you what kind of numbers we're talking about, and then I showed you the map of this, uh, the country showing the states that, and it's basically Vermont and um, uh, Massachusetts, the only two states that don't do point of sale. Um, so we definitely support that. Um, <clears throat> as to H94, um, I guess what I would say is we don't oppose it. Um, we get it. Um, you know, at t the other providers, operate in a very competitive market. Um, it's difficult for them to build in rural areas because of the low density and the, um, uh, the cost of doing that. Um, a lot of their money has to go to just upgrading and densifying their existing network to keep up with the changes in technology and to be able to handle the exponentially increasing amount of data that's going across those networks. So it is difficult to get into the rural areas. Um, you know, the philosophically, the increase in the fee is sort of a gulp factor because it does, it increases the cost of our... Gulp factor? Gulp factor, yes. It increases the cost of, uh, of our service to the customers, basically the customers, other than the prepaid, uh, as it stands right now, who pay that. So it's going to come out of the monitors. Um, but, you know, there is a problem, and it's a legitimate problem. Um, we're trying to solve it, we're getting there, but it isn't being solved fast enough, so we understand uh, the need for the state to try and fill that <coughs> hole or do something about it. So 
um, um, I guess what I can say is that I'm not going to go around the building, you know, trumpeting support for this increase, but we're not going to oppose it. Sure, Dr. Um, so <coughs> when we spoke about the, the prepaid cards last time, yeah. Maria, ref, uh, like council referenced a, a federal right. law change, but didn't have specifics on it. Can you, can you provide any? I, I talked more briefly. I, I don't, and I, but I'd like to know more about it. I did speak with my partner uh, Scott Mackey, who specializes in consulting for the wireless companies on tax policy issues. He does this nationally. It's not just in Vermont. And he, he confirmed there is such a law. He was going to send me a citation to it. Uh, I don't have that at this point. But um, I'm going to take Maria's word that it exists, uh, and I'm going to track it down, because obviously if, if that, can get that could that be dispositive in and of itself, um, I will do that. Thank you. Um, and per a conversation I had with you, Mr. Chairman, yesterday, I'd actually like to talk about it's 248A, uh, but I know uh, maybe I've only got five minutes, and perhaps I should hold off on that. I sent Sarah a bunch of stuff. We've got ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, Did you want to get into? Yeah. I, no. I just want to. I just want to um, say that I really appreciate the acknowledgement that there is a problem. So thank you. I think it's. I mean, I. We all experience it. Um, so it's obvious. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, 2488A is the permitting process for that cell carriers can use um, these would be the Public Utilities Commission to get permits for building cell sites. It was enacted in 2007. It is optional. In other words, you don't have to use it, but if you don't use it, you're most likely going to need to go through Act 250 and local zoning. Um, the statute was originally enacted with a sunset because it was kind of a big deal to create a permitting process that bypassed Act 250 in local zoning. Um, since then, that sunset's been extended four times, and we're here to ask that it be made permanent. Um, in H160, um, bill section, I think it's two or three, does that. Just simply, it's a striking out subsection I in 248A, uh, which was the, is the sunset. Um, Oh, this isn't the one I wanted to look at. Oh, let me see. Well, let me give you this one. This was from two years ago. This is a document that the Department of Public Service generated the last time we had this uh, uh, discussion about, uh, at that time, extending the sunset. And this was just showing statistics of the usage of 248A by the various providers during the period of 2010 to 2016. As you'll see, 566 uh, petitions, um, and I'm going to get into this uh, time permitting. There's various sort of gradations or classifications of projects that are uh, that are in the statute, and they, and they set forth that there. Um, you'll see from the bottom uh, table that AT&T during that period was the largest user uh, of the 248A. You know, followed closely by Verizon. Uh, VTEL and, and the others. So um, it's getting a lot of use. Um, we're continuing to use it. Um, we have our first net project that involves some 30 new sites, and these are going to be in areas that are not covered. Um, that will, uh, will that 248A will be very helpful uh, for. And, and you know, not only does that serve the first responder community, but it also will serve. Our regular uh, commercial or customers, um, um, folks. Um, so that's usage since 2016. I don't know what the numbers are, but I know, do know that AT&T has been using it right along. Um, okay, let's see what else I have on this one. Okay, well that's basically it. So. Representative, I was flipping just, around I was so much. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do have a question. Go ahead. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, it, I know in Section 248 for all other kinds right. of certificates of public good, even though it's not, it's not reviewed as an Act 250 application, the Act 250 criteria are used. Is that the same? Exactly. It is. So let me just. Uh, this will be. Try not to get too granular on this. This, this document goes through that. There's the three categories of projects. The 
the first one I want to speak to is de minimis. That's basically putting new equipment uh, on or upgrading existing equipment on an existing facility. Um, and it's a pretty uh, basic process. You give notice to the municipality and the department and there's a 30 day clock in which somebody can object to whether it qualifies as a de minimis project. And if, it, if nobody says anything, then you get a permit uh, and it just comes right out. Um, limited size and scope, uh, that is essentially most of the, where the activity is. That relates to towers not more than 140 feet tall. Um, you have to give notice to the town, to the department, uh, and to the adjoining landowners at least 60 days before you can file your actual application. And I stress at least because you can do it 90 and 120 days and that often happens. Um, if there are no objections, which is the majority of cases, uh, the, the Certificate of Public Good is to be issued within 60 days. Um, if there are objections, the board agrees to hold a, a we'll, we'll look into it and they have another 90 days. The final category is basically all other, um, tall towers, towers more than 150 feet, uh, 140 feet tall. Um, again, 60 days pre -no uh, advanced filing pre-notice. Um, and timelines when the um, Public Utility Commissions are to uh, get their CPG out. Um, the standards are for tall towers, uh, the facility will not have an undue adverse effect on aesthetics, historic site, et cetera, et cetera. Views from I-89, I-91, officially designated scenic highways. Um, and in, in considering those issues, the Public Utilities Commission is supposed to uh, take into account um, the criteria, the relevant criteria in Act 250, uh, limited size and scope projects. Most of those criteria are sort of deemed uh, to be waived at the get-go, uh, except for floodways, building and floodways, and then aesthetic, scenic, beauty, et cetera. But if somebody raises an issue saying uh, this has an impact under some of, some of these other criteria, the Commission can um, pull those in and, and take a look at it with respect to those criteria. Um, both of those projects, um, tall towers, limited size and scope, there's a lot of language in 248A about uh, whether or not you can co-locate on or at an existing telecom facility and there's some real granular kind of specifications in terms of the distances that you have to look and so forth and so on. But basically the statute essentially says that if you can co-locate somewhere else, um, then you're not going to get a permit for what you're proposing if that's the case. And this is uh, um, something that's been discussed a lot over the years. Um, and, and this is the notion that um, the Public Utilities Commission must give substantial deference to the relevant town's town plan, the recommendation of the town's select board and planning commission, which can be based on local zoning. And the problem with just saying that the local zoning absolutely applies is that sometimes it just doesn't work in terms of projects. There's a lot of ordinances that date from the 90s that say telecom towers can only be, I think, 10 feet taller than the, uh, tr uh, the tree canopy around you. And from a propagation point of view, that can be very problematic. And from a ability to co-locate, you know, you can't set two antenna arrays in a 10-foot space, so you need to be taller. Um, we don't have the ability to condemn a property for locating a site. We have to work on a voluntary basis with landowners, so sometimes, you know, we can only find a parcel where maybe the setback isn't adequate in terms of the zoning ordinance, setback from about property lines. That gives the Public Utilities Commission take a look at that. If it can work with those set setbacks, then you, you've got to do it. But if it doesn't, you know, they have the ability to say, well, the greater good of having coverage is such that we will allow a deviation from that. So if there's a tension there, but that seems to have been uh, a good way of bridging that tension is to make the, 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 uh, um, the commission look at uh, the, the local zoning in, in a town plan. Um, if a town asks the applicant, and this should happen, in any development project, you go and talk to the people before you, you, you know, the affected parties, the town, the neighbors and stuff like that, but there's been cases where providers have just simply filed their application or done their pre-notice and then filed their application. So now if there's a request to meet with the Select Board or Planning Commission, 
Um, the carrier has to go and the department has to go and meet and talk and hear them out. And that sometimes can be very productive in making changes. Um, it's written into the statute that the select board and the planning commission has an absolute right to appear and participate. Um, one of the complaints early on was that the utility commission was issuing decisions where there had been comments from the town and nothing was said in the decision. It was like it was never said. Uh, so it's now if the town says something, even if the, the ruling is against what the town says, they've got to at least speak to it in the decision. <coughs> Um, and the town has the right to ask the department to retain an expert. So, um, overall, it's a successful program. Um, I don't think there's been a lot of controversy in terms of projects. There's been some, but not not a huge amount. And uh, seems like it, you know, incorporates Act 250 values, gives deference to the towns. It's very helpful to the carriers. It seems to be working, and we would ask that um, the committee favorably consider. We're killing the sunset. Um, in terms of uh, does AT and T um, di differentiate between commercial application and a first net application? In what way? You mean? Uh, I mean, we have our first net projects. Right. which were or the result of a dialogue with the Department of Public Safety where they basically said, we want you to build in these areas primarily because there was no coverage. And so we're doing that, 30 sites over the next four years, and there's six more that are going to be built by a um, third party that's going to be done on our behalf. Um, so, so one of my questions is a very familiar one, which is about hardening towers for FirstNet as opposed to a higher standard if they are purposes, primary purpose. I know there's co making use of them for commercial in that sense too. But hardening to a higher standard, generators with longer run, run time, higher wind resistance. Um, you know, um, Representative, I'm not absolutely sure if there's a separate set of specifications in that regard uh, for the first net sites. There may well be. I honestly don't know. So um, there are standards for emergency communications. I, mean, I don't know if they're mandatory or voluntary. I mean, I know there's backup batteries at all the sites. Most of the sites have generators, not all of them. Um, and, you know, I think the towers are all engineered, if they're towers, um, to meet, you know, certain wind loads and ice loads and things like that, whether they're stronger or better in relation to a regular old cell site, I don't know, I'm sorry, but I can try and find out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, is there a, uh, a map showing where those 30 sites are? There is, but I'd have to like jump out the window and commit suicide before I could give that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my one. <laughs> nope, no one's ever said that. <laughs> I just want to know we're two weeks. I know, I know. It's a, it's a sore, it's an issue. Everybody wants to know. Uh, there is a map that po folks at public safety, you know, we worked in, in conjunction with them to the development. Uh, you know, I wish I could say more, but it is proprietary and I can't. <laughs> and so that, of course, makes it hard to not invest in areas where we're allowing additional investment in areas where you may be going. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I would say, well, yeah, no, you're right. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of a difference with wireline or cable and mobile. Uh, because yeah. my sense is that most of the investment that the state is looking at doing is with respect to wired. You know, cable, uh, fiber optic, and things like that. that. That certainly, if we had a site in an area or going in an area that's going to provide really high speed mobile service, maybe that would avoid the need to, to do the wired thing. But generally, you're going to want to do both. Um, and we're going to do the, the mobile, the wireless, and, and the station. As you know, the business case is so poor in some of these places where the phone lines are problematic. You know, it, be helpful for us to be able to prioritize places that there was not going to be a solution coming soon. I guess that begs the question: Is there is there um, 
is there a map, is there a plan for um, cell towers in general? Not first net towers, but is, is there? They do develop, you know, I mean, they have what they call search rings. They go out, the, the, the network engineers identify areas where, you know, they would like to build facilities. Search rings are created. Site acquisition consultants go out to look for landowners who might be willing to lease. So they do have these plans. They're fluid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll have a list for 2020, and it's sort of like if we've got the money, and if we're not, you know, that money is, they're triaging their resources amongst all the states. And so there is a plan, and but again, it's proprietary. And, and I guess the concern is that, you know, in the end, you put up a tower, our competitors know where it is. Frankly, they'll end up probably being on the tower. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's an interim period. If we're in a new area, if we're the only one, we might get a few more customers and get them sewn up. I mean, if we let that, our competitors know that in advance, then we, we lose that slate and possibly lose that slate. But it's, it is a, it's a brutally competitive market, so they hold their cards to the chips. Yeah. Sorry. Are we ending? Uh, no, you're taking up. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, we need to be voting on uh, <laughs> uh, Well, so I, just, to, just to follow up, I mean, it's, it's frustrating trying to coordinate the build out of cell phone service when we don't know what, what the companies are doing because it's all pr pr proprietary. Right? So. I, I, certainly, I certainly appreciate that, uh, Representative. I guess my sort of only response would be, I'm not anticipating that the state of Vermont is looking to build out, you know, build, create a cell phone company, license spectrum, do all of that, that you're really focused on the, on the land, I'll call it landline, it's, you know, well, uh, fiber optic or coax. I mean, it, 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 it seems to me that cell phone, uh, the cell towers are good not only for voice uh, uh, service, in places where the, the copper lines are deteriorating and people are, and, and people are not going to have access to a dial tone if there isn't a cell tower nearby, um, but also for broadband in, in, in those last mile situations. It's true. So, so, yeah. so how, how do we coordinate this when we can't coordinate it? It's, it's just, I'm just wondering. I, I don't know the answer. This is all new to me. So. Yeah, I don't know if I can give you a real answer. I think, you know, it's pretty well known where there's poor landline-based broadband service, and state should just focus on those areas. And if we're and if we're going to be going in there, and that might have avoided you having to go there, well, it's still all for the good, I suppose. You know, you could say, well, that money that would have gone to the landline could have gone somewhere else. And I, and I don't right. really have a good right. response to that. Okay. One last question, and I'll give up, and that is uh, the. Uh, DPS, uh, uh, whatever, whatever it's called, but the, the drive study that they right. did, um, has that been really useful to, to uh, AT&T and any other companies? Well, I think it is. They were, they, they're, they're very interested, and in fact, they asked for the data from the department, um, and so you know, they, they, they noticed that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, kind of two uh, questions. First is uh, CPGs are public documents. Right. Yes. So, theoretically, uh, obviously, you can't give us information. But if that re uh, if where people are building is recorded, then that there should be a mechanism to find out what projects are going on, what CPGs have been issued. That's right. You can the, the right. online. You I think you know take a little doing, but it's manual, and you can yeah. go through the. Um, the board's orders and see. Yeah. And uh, kind of to build off uh, what Scott said, um, would you be able to um, ask AT&T if they have any suggestions on how to formulate a holistic full coverage plan for the state that would incorporate their services, uh, or perhaps a better way to put it, how their services could be incorporated into a holistic plan that will most efficiently serve all residents? I'd just be happy to ask that question. Yeah. So is that fair? Good. Good. Any other questions? <coughs> I think we are back at 10.
This is Tim Briglin calling. I'm the uh, chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. Yeah. And uh, we're uh, happy that you are able to join us today. I've, I've got a um, committee of uh, uh, seven other people here with me today. And I um, understand you can spend a, <laughs> spend a few minutes with us on the phone. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to testify. Um, and I think what I am supposed to be testifying about is precision land management uh, as it relates to agriculture and water quality opportunities and how technology supports that within, um, or is not supporting it currently within Vermont. Yep, I think that's right. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, is really a necessity to have the accuracy so that those systems work is uh, you know real dependable uh, <coughs> hours and coverage throughout the, all of our valleys and, and so um, it, it, it's something that uh, is usable in uh, ensuring that your the tillage practices um, and variable rate applications of of uh, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizer, all of that uh, can then link to the yield and, and uh, managing of the, of the soils within the, the, the farm's uh, database that, they, that everything gets mapped. Mm -hmm. um, there's two ways to provide that uh, sub one inch accuracy and one is to... Yes. Yeah. Uh, Brian? Really good. Brian? Brian? Yes? Can we interrupt you for just a sec? Sure. I have a member who has a question for you. Brian, this is Representative Sibilia, and this is the Energy and Technology Committee. So if I could ask you to indulge us and maybe give us a 50,000 foot um, view, one minute description of the systems that you're talking about and the goal of those systems so that we can understand. Sure. Uh, so the, uh, the today's current uh, farm equipment it can be set up with a GPS uh, system that uh, controls and, and monitors everything that you're doing. And you can link that to planting, to, to tillage, to planting, to fertilizing, to harvesting. And, it, and uh, when you have that, uh, you map your fields and then uh, the, it, it sets it all. And if it's accurate it sets it down to sub one inch accuracy and so that your maps overlay and you can really control um, and ensure you're not over fertilizing ensure uh, you could even use practices of things called strip till for instance where you're not tilling all of the soil but you're tilling uh, a seed bed for uh, maybe just a, a six inch seed bed uh, in and uh, so that you're not disturbing all the soils and you don't have the same erosion. There's a lot of practices that apply and can be used when you have this type of accuracy. Vermont is really challenged in the ability to do a lot of these in that we do not have uh, dependable cell phones and we do not have an RTK tower system. Um, I'm preparing, there's, there's, so that's the second way that the technology committee can support in, in the absence of, of uh, quality cell phones, we can put our own radio towers in and those radio towers uh, will cover, um, they'll, they'll cover an eight mile radius uh, and, and down to the sub one inch and it, you start to lose the, as you f get further away from the radio tower, you'll start to lose some of the accuracy. So it'll actually go out to a 30 mile radius, but to get to the sub one inch, it's an eight mile radius. Um, and those are, that's another way that we could, could so to speak, skin the cat and, and being able to provide those tools that are necessary to feed into water quality. Um, I'm going to be, that those towers cost $6,000 a piece. Um, I'm going to put four up this year and see, uh, basically test it and see if it works. It would be something that is an interim solution. It seems to be more achievable maybe than, 
than uh, in the short term having tremendous improvements in the, the uh, cell phone services throughout Vermont and it's something that we could control and, and provide the necessary uh, things to have one of those stations is uh, internet service and power and then it will send out the radio signal and everything adjusts off from that radio signal. So Brian, Brian, this is Tim Briglin again. Can can you um, tell us a little bit about more about the RTK technology? Is that something that would be privately implemented? And what you simply have to do is to um, uh, uh, hook each tower up to a broadband connection, and obviously it has to have some power as well. Yes, uh, it, it's something, and it's uh, it's not controlled the same way as uh, the cell phone towers. It's only need to be three feet off the ground. They used to be larger towers that would go out into a farm field. The technology has progressed, and so now it actually comes in a box. Uh, you have a, an antenna that needs to go up, but the box needs to be three feet off the ground. Um, it's something that uh, I had wanted to pitch to the committee last year. We were scheduled to talk to you last year, and I wanted to pitch it as something that maybe we could get a grant and, and share some expense and get better coverage. Um, and is this a technology that's, that's primarily used in the agricultural world, or is, are, are, there, are there other uses out there where... where um, it can be used by um, any you have a, a subscription to link to, to uh, connect to the tower uh, groups there. It's all one large, it actually goes across the U.S. There's a lot of coverage in, uh, throughout North America. It actually goes up into Canada as well, this whole, this whole system. And uh, I think that's $600 a year to connect no limits. It's not like uh, data coverage or anything like that where you only are allowed so many so many bytes. Uh, it, it, but your your receiver can can uh, connect to any of those towers. If you go between towers, they're all they're all interconnected. Um, the uh, the coverage map gets pretty sparse when you get up here into New England because uh, there have not been a lot of, of people that have input into it, uh, and that's why I wanted to try it in Vermont. Uh, any other industry that, that runs off from GPS can utilize that. They just have to pay the, they, they have to pay if they're doing it. It's, it's for GPS, it's for global positioning systems, and, and so any, uh, if you had perhaps a, uh, another service company that wants to track their vehicles and if they find that that's more dependable than or cheaper than satellite or or cell phone service then that's uh, a way that they could do it um, we, um, so Brian we've got a couple other questions from folks around the table um, representative chase yeah uh, right quick is this the same technology that is used for like quarrying and precision grading and could it be leveraged for autonomous cars and stuff like that as well or is it pretty much just agricultural no I, I think it could be in in the future but you'd have to have uh, whatever for like autonomous cars you have absolutely going to need to to ensure for it to work you need to ensure continuous coverage and right so um, whatever system it, it it would certainly work for that because it, it, it gets you sub one inch assuming we had the adequate coverage and I'm not familiar with the did you say grading I said uh, quarrying and like precision oh. grading like uh, you know giant caterpillar graders and bulldozers uh, yes I mean it certainly could be that the, I'm not sure what it does for elevation change uh, a lot of times in the in the grading, you have to put uh, some some posts out, uh, gotcha. but uh, I could look into that for you. I, I don't see why it, it wouldn't work if it gets sub one inch uh, positioning. It might need to be paired with some other some other link. Thank you, um, Brian. This is a um, is, is this a one way system that your the receiver mounted on the 
farm equipment receives the GPS data and then applies it? Or is there a two-way communication involved? It's a receiver system, yes. Receiver. Uh, the, the, the equipment, whatever, wherever you're uh, operating out of, whether it be a tractor or a sprayer, uh, you have a, a WASP receiver on there, and that will receive the, the radio communications. Yeah, um, Ryan, you said you both need both power and cell service for this to work. Uh, is you this need power and, and internet service? And internet, oh, and internet service. Okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of power, is this behind the meter? Is this a line you you're running out to the field where the uh, RKK tower is? Uh, what we'll do is we'll put a, uh, we have four stores throughout Vermont and my, my plans for initially at least is to mount them in, in our stores where we can just plug into an outlet. Oh, I see. Okay. And, um, and the internet services, that's why you need the broadband, obviously. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for, for Brian? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can put a, a number on this, but what kind of, uh, well, I mean, you talked about multiple benefits, including environmental, water quality, things like that, but I imagine one of the primary drivers is, is to be more efficient, increase your productivity. And do you have, can you quantify that at all? You know, the, <coughs> this kind of system potentially makes you 10% more efficient? Um, I think I would defer to a, a dairyman uh, or farmer who's actually utilized the technology and see. Um, I know that uh, it allows them to to uh, run different hours sometimes, for instance, uh, planting at night. You used to have to have row markers where you had to be able to visibly see everything or have uh, a really good light set up that, that uh, covered out to your markers and now with the, the technology you can you can work <coughs> around the clock when you have small weather windows so uh, I think it's a, a combination of productivity and uh, you know increase increasing the productivity the ability to use uh, equipment that you it's difficult to judge some of our mowers now are 32 feet wide and uh, it's a very difficult thing to judge and you lose the productivity because you have more overlap if, or you leave tails in the field for instance and so in all of the aspects where you're using it there's certainly some productivity gains it'd be tough for me to quantify it without more scientific data mm -hmm. um, certainly the biggest area that I see is the management productivity and the ability to have accurate data for for both the state and federal oversight. Um, everything is mapped. Everything is is accounted for. It's not pencil and paper, and and so it allows a manager to be more scientific and productive in in their application of time and in their ability to ensure that they're fulfilling all of the the regulatory requirements. And Brian, this is Tim Briglin again. To, to, to what extent are folks in the agricultural community, um, is, there, um, is the technology that, that they're currently employing um, able to plug into a system like this? Or is it, uh, is it a build it and they will come kind of situation? Or is the technology out there and folks are looking for the, uh, the bandwidth out there, which you're creating to, to, to serve what they currently have? There, uh, there is a significant number of our agricultural operations that are already have invested in the technologies. Um, it, their ability to use it to its fullest is quite limited. But our large and medium dairies uh, that have upgraded equipment in the last, uh, I'd say, roughly 10 years, a lot of that equipment is is already outfitted with the ability to utilize this and, and uh, we have a, a number of them that have, are trying to utilize it. Uh, in fact, I've got a, a new hemp grower who 
uh, needs this technology to uh, be to be able to do what he needs to do because they're doing and, and the vegetable growers uh, can use this because if you've seen where you go down and, and you make hills and, and you lay your mulch plastic and you want to be able to drive right back over that and transplant into that hill and you want to uh, the ability to do that and not tear the plastic, you need some one inch accuracy or, or you're going to have problems where you're tearing plastic and creating uh, weed, potential weed issues and, and uh, so uh, there's a lot of other areas and they're using that currently, it's just we're having a very difficult time to gain the accuracy necessary. We're about at the six inch accuracy mark now and it seems like that would be great but it, it just, it's not the uh, the variance by the time you get done a long field, it, it, it's not it's, it's not workable really. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, th this was really helpful I, um, as part of our testimony uh, that we're going to receive this morning. I think we're actually going to see some visual of, of these um, systems in, in place. So um, it was really helpful for you to give us an introduction to this, and um, and we'll we'll let you get back to work. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, when I'm over the, the, uh, at the State House, I'll drop off a, a catalog that just shows you what some of the equipment is, and, and you could circulate it with the committee um, as part of that education process. Great. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Take care. All right. Um, so next on our list, um, we have Jonathan Chamberlain. Who might not be here? Um, is Scott here? I'm here. Okay. Yeah, please. All right, please join us. <laughs> All right, I guess I could stand here. Or are you, or are you welcome to, to sit at okay. the table? Okay. I'm comfortable either way. Okay. The microphone, too. Okay, great. And if you could, um, we tape all our, um, our our hearings. If you mm -hmm. could identify yourself for the record, uh, sure. Be great. First thing I want to do is make sure my cell phone doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm Scott Magnin. Uh, I'm from St. Albans, Vermont. I uh, grew up on a dairy farm. Um, been in agriculture my whole life. In 1997, I started uh, operation doing uh, crop work for farmers, and part of that was manure spreading. And uh, as, as things developed in Vermont, we, uh, we found a need to do a better job at recording what we were doing in our manure spreading application. It was a requirement through the LFOs at that time to map or to, to have records of what we were doing. So that's how I got involved with Precision Ag probably 10 years ago. Uh, so we just started by mapping what we were doing um, so we could keep track. It was very cumbersome. We were doing multiple farms and to train operators or even come up with a system to figure out what we had done was difficult. So this was the avenue that we pursued. In doing that, I found it difficult in Vermont to find access to resources to be able to develop that. So we were kind of a little bit on the leading edge of that technology and the software support. So. I struggled with it, but I made it work. It was definitely an improvement. So in <coughs> about, I think in 2014, I became a dealer for Ag Leader Technology. Uh, it was a company out of, out of Ames, Iowa, uh, that sell, sell precision ag equipment, and they al also provide training. So I was able to get software training, hardware training out of Ames. Um, so since we've done several projects for several farmers in the area, um, we've gone from manure spreading into planting, fertilizing, um, cultivating, so we've used a lot of technology. We, um, there has been some seed funding through the Department of Ag, and we've utilized that for, for our customers. And we've gone from manure spreading with those seed grants to be cut. They've, they've allowed a little bit more as we've tied it to water quality and how, how these systems improve both both the farm operation and and the uh, water quality um, so precision ag it's gonna pinpoint everything that's put down on the ground seed fertilizer manure it'll record that rate it'll give you a map 
um, that's being recorded on, on the display inside the tractor. And in, in that recording, we can also set that rate. So we, we have full control and a full record of what we've done. Sorry. And uh, so everything's done precisely. <coughs> um, so as I listened to Bron the, at least the tail part of Brian's testimony. Um, so we've, we have some operations we're using RTK on. Um, I actually haven't spent a lot of time researching the, the Wi-Fi capabilities on RTK because I know it's not, not going to work. So the one RTK system we've sold, we put up a base station and we're using radios. And we've also, we have subscription services so we can gain some accuracy. We gain another set of satellites. The operator pays in to get those extra satellites. So those have been the workarounds for not having Wi-Fi. Um, if we did have more Wi-Fi access, we would, <coughs> they would drop the expense some and give us one more option to get that accuracy in Vermont. Uh, one limitation I have without Wi-Fi is uh, these systems are set up just like your laptop, desktop, where everything, a lot of this stuff is internet based, so as far as data management goes, um, it's a little bit limited there. We, we could offer remote support to these outer areas rather than a drive up to the farm and trying to figure out how to build a 10 minute issue. We could, we could link in, look at the operator's display. Also data could come to my office so I could get that that data moved to wherever I needed to as far as nutrient management planners and things. We could do all that wirelessly if, if we did have better internet. So right right now the workaround is USBs, um, a little bit limited. We're, we're moving forward. Without it, it would certainly be very helpful with it. So I guess I'll open it up to so question. To, to what extent, um, what's the scale of the agricultural setup, the size of the farm, if you will, that can actually use this um, type of technology profitably? You know, mm -hmm. How small a farm uh, can afford to use this technology and, um, you know, and, and make it work uh, in a profitable way? Sure. Well, we're a custom operation, so we're using the technology on all of our farms, whether it be uh, 50 acres up to a thousand acres so there's a range there because we're a custom operator and we're subcontracting um, scale wise to buy your own uh, with funding that helps a lot but to have it make sense to go out and buy your own 200 plus acres maybe that's a very rough number it really depends on how valuable your crop is mm -hmm. so that's more like conventional crops if you had a specialty crop I could see someone investing at a, at a lot on a smaller scale we've done smaller scale jobs we did a hops farm where we gridded out the um, we did a grid pattern for their hops posts so that was a 50 acre hops farm that utilized the technology there um, we're seeing <coughs> precision ag as a, a way to um, kind of enhance some of these specialty markets. Um, we do sunflowers on our farm and we're using, we're planning with a subscription based um, guidance and, uh, and then going in and cultivating. So we're kind of bringing back the cultivator and we can be more productive uh, than we would otherwise because we're cultivating at five or six miles an hour and not running over crops where before we we're doing it freehand you're down around three miles an hour running over some crops. So, so this is kind of the inverse of that question, but um, and since you're selling this product, um, it sounds like the sales pitch on the product is a return on investment, that this is going to save you X amount of dollars and that, that um, this is going to increase your productivity. Um, you know, such a, what is the context of that? Um, when you're selling the subscription or you're selling the, you know, the product itself um, sure. to, to a farmer, uh, this is going to pay for itself in a year and a half. It's going to pay for itself in five years. Uh, I'm a terrible salesman. I really <laughs> like working with technology. I love working you with might have some, You might have some folks here <laughs> So anyway, um, it really depends. We had, for example, we had a field this year, a 10 acre field. We didn't have a down pressure system on it and a no-till field. And this will be a presentation I'm giving on 
Friday at the Precision Ag Forum at, at the Abbey in Sheldon, but we, we had a total crop loss on that field, so that was a $6,000 loss. If we had a, a monitoring system to look at down pressure, that's a $6,000 gain in one field. Um, uh, if you're no-till planting and you've got rows that go like this, a, an overlap, maybe a 5% loss on every acre, uh, just with overlaps and, and width changes. Um, if you don't have seed tube monitoring on, and you're, you have, say, 10% skips and doubles over two rows, it's going to be a 3% loss of planting performance. So every every aspect that you're going to use it on, you're going to gain a percentage um, from maybe 2% to 100%. Questions? Yeah, uh, you mentioned a lot of data intensity as far as <coughs> positioning. Is there other data that's transmitted through the si uh, system, like precipitation, so you can monitor irrigation or runoff, things like that? Not on our systems. Okay. Um, I believe there's there's technology out there, and I'm sure it's going to, I mean, we're on a upward trend. So, uh, like the Wi-Fi argument is, the more the, more the technology events that advances, the more we're going to, that it's going to head in that direction. We can get around it now, but I can see it starting to be a roadblock the farther out we go. So it's not to the point where you're not spreading because it's about to rain and wash it all off yet? With, no, that's with still one a, system. No, that's still a, it's not going to, it's not going to flash a red thing, don't spread, don't spread, don't yeah. spread. <laughs> Mike, let's go. Yeah. Um, so I thought I heard you say that uh, because you don't have access to Wi-Fi, uh, you can still uh, make the system work by getting additional satellites, subscribing yep. to additional satellites. How much precision does that give you? Uh, you're gonna, you're not gonna get down to the sub inch. You'll need RTK for that. And uh, so there's the way Brian was talking about for RTK, and also you could buy a base station and do it radio with a radio. Uh, the the subscription service a little less accurate. We have achieved about an inch. Mm -hmm. So for some applications like planting, cultivating, it's been been pretty good. You wouldn't be able to do drainage tile. You wouldn't be able to do um, the cultivating is definitely better with the sub inch um, versus the subscription. But anyway, in the one to one to three range. Yeah. Uh, and could you clarify what the acronym is? So it's RTK. Yes, and I should know this is a dealer. Just, you have to look that one up. As opposed to RKK, which I've been real time kinetic. Real time. Thing. Something like that. Yep. Okay. <coughs> um, so you were talking about Wi-Fi as. Uh, as, as what you need to make this make this go. How, how do you how do you get Wi-Fi? You, you're, not, you're not. I mean, it's cell phone service with that. Yeah, cell that phone contract. We have some. We do run. Uh, we move around enough where I have three AT and T uh, hotspots I buy from AT and T. They're in our tractors. So whenever we move around enough, we we send our data through that. So it's an AT and T subscription on a Wi-Fi hotspot. But you could do it off your phone. If you had a Wi-Fi hotspot to send it, I think the ones Brian talking about, you're going to need a little bit uh, more expensive, heavier-duty modem than just a hotspot for data moving data around. You can do that with just any Wi-Fi hotspot. Over the cell phone network, though. That's, that's over the cell phone so, so network. So basically, in terms of connectivity, what you need is, 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 is cell phone coverage. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, one, one more. So the. Um, I get the geographical pinpointing so you're not doing overlap, but do you also, I mean, for like variable rate applications, are you inputting soil type, slope, drainage? Um, yeah, I think what you're referring to is subscriptions. And so there's been a, a little, right now we're field to field. And we're building towards that in Vermont. It's done in other areas of the country. The limitation there is being able to go full circle. So we need we need harvest maps, and there's been very few people that have harvest maps in Vermont. Um, our business, we got a seep grant for a customer. We're going to do a harvest uh, 
harvest setup, so we'll have our harvest data, and now we can start using the harvest data to build those maps. So we're moving, moving more towards our ability um, and expertise to do that. I don't know if that answered that question or not. Um, I guess the what was underlying that question is so a lot of the information that you're working with is data that, that you collect and input into your programming. Yes. And then you use the the GPS to apply that information. That's correct. Effectively. Yep. We can do it. We can predetermine it, put it in, or we can do it like just punch in four thousand gallons or whatever our rate is. Mm -hmm. I like the, the potential to link it to like wind speed for spray applications and you have that red light that <laughs> flashes short. Yeah. So in terms of deep speeds, upload and download speeds, is there an optimal or minimum for use of this system? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. And I want to be, I just want to clarify on the Wi-Fi. So, and make sure that I understand how this technology, so Wi-Fi, you, you, could you run this system off of cable with like hotspots set up? Or do you have to have cellular service? It would have to be cellular because we're out in the middle of a field, so there'd be no way to so cable run, that. But you could run like a booster off of cable. Yeah, or yeah, if it could reach out far enough to cover a I'm trying big to understand what the technology area. is yeah, that is needed here. If it's internet or if it's I think I think with the RTK, and like I said, I'm not an expert on the RTK part of it, um, I think you would need cellular coverage. But with moving data around, I just need Wi-Fi. You person this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, depending on how nerdy you want to get into it right now, we can nerd out later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's true. I could find um, those answers. Um, if, if you wanted me to get back to you, I could give you more information I, by contact. In yeah. I think what the we're interested in is um, what type of technology we have to get into these rural areas in order to enable uh, this type of technology. Right. You know, is it more cell phone towers? Is it uh, making sure we have um, uh, fiber that uh, can link into a, uh, an RTK uh, modem? If that's what it's called. So you know, that's what this committee is trying to figure out. Okay. Uh, keep us out of the field, please. But <laughs> you know, but 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 the technology that we need to to help um, operate better is what we're trying to figure out. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, Bill, were you going to show us next? Yeah. So again, we're recording these, Bill. If you could identify yourself for the record and uh, and, and take it away. Oh, sure. I uh, my name is Bill Rommel. I. Uh, I'm chair of uh, Vermont Dairy Producer Alliance, and my brother and I farm in Sheldon. We milk about 900 cows. We crop something like 1,500 acres, uh, 850 acres of corn, and uh, 650 acres of uh, grassland. We have a digester on our farm. With a digester, you get interested in things like drag lines. And you are you familiar at all with the drag line? I'm not. So as far as how do you uh, how do you spread your manure? And you can do it now with a drag line, <coughs> and you can pump manure from the manure pit with that drag line as far as two miles away out into a field. Okay, and then the toolbar on the tractor, the big $200,000 tractor with the GPS, uh, and, and the, the pump that is at the manure pit pumping out to the tractor, to the toolbar, needs a signal. So what the deal is this, if you, use, if you have a smartphone and you only use it to talk, you're not utilizing the smartphone. You're communicating, but you're not using all of the service availability that it would have. If you spend $200,000 on a tractor, and if you have 
more than a half a dozen of those tractors, it would be nice to use full potential. But the potential requires that signal. So here we are back at the drag line, for example. You pump the manure out to the field, and the tractor has a line that is dragging behind it. So you have a transport line going to the field, and then you have a line being dragged by the tractor back and forth. And it has shanks that are opening a trench. And the manure is being injected into the, into the trench. So you're reducing the potential for runoff. You don't really have any odor because the dirt falls back over the top of the waste stream once it's once it's injected. You're not losing your ammonia or your nitrogen to the atmosphere. Your neighbors are pleased with you. Uh, you're not putting any traffic on the road. Uh, let's see, there are a few other attributes like you're, you're reducing compaction of your soil. Uh, it, it goes on anyway. The fuel usage is about half of what you would spend. And the time is reduced to a fraction. I, to, to say to say half, I, I'd say probably something like half of the amount of time to to put out. If you're going to put out a million gallons of manure today or in the next two days, you can do it with that machine. You can do it with some precision. But you know one thing that you need to do when you come to the end of the uh, end of the field. You need to be able to push a button to stop the pump. And if you don't have a reliable signal, you have a you have a mess. <laughs> and and it and it's expensive. So it may be that and you know how it works on today's bigger farms. If you have your operation set up in an area and maybe you have two or three other farms that you use for crops across town on this side, and maybe you have another couple of farms in another location uh, down below uh, more cropland, some of them may have the signal and some of them don't. So if you have an area where that you'd like to use that, you say, okay, I'll take the manure from my farm into a satellite manure pit that will service these three operations. And we can do that with some precision and record it and it, and it works good. I mean, in the interest of the environment and nutrients and the farm, it works for everybody. But it doesn't work if you don't have something as simple as a, a cell phone signal. You know? So I, I think that's the real point Farms are pretty strapped today. We're caught again in a downturn, and you all know that. And we'll we'll come out of it. We're starting to emerge a bit now. It's starting to show signs of coming back up. But it takes time, and I think what you're talking about is if if the expectation is that the farms should all do something. For communication with that equipment as opposed to the state doing something then you're going to have you're, you're not going to get the result you're looking for toward the environment and and, it, and the farmers not going to get the utilization of the equipment that it's standard <coughs> manufacturing now and, and we can't use it because we don't have the signal well we can use it on this farm but we can't use it over there it's not very handy at all. I have a friend in Canada. He's near Alberg, Vermont. He's in the town of Noyan, which is next door. He does precision. He does no-till planting. So he said, come ride with me. So I get in this. His, it was a John Deere, but I got in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so he says, we're going to outline the field. And, and it records it, okay? It maps it. And then, once he outlines the field, 
he can plant the rest of the field and it's free. He gets to the uh, end of the row and gets set up and then as he starts he pushes his button and it, and it goes automatic and you, you sit there and you visit as you go down the field with this big planter behind him. And I said, where's your signal coming from? You guys up here in Canada, you got some good signal. He said, I, I have a poor signal here. He said, I'm using the signal off the fertilizer and feed dealer in Champlain, New York. And he said, without that, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I'm doing. Is that the RT, RTK radio? Yeah. Huh. So, so you think of the progress that we've made with technology. You think of the things that we can do and that we do in certain places with technology. But let me, let me conclude by saying this. Imagine if you were on the moon and you didn't have something as simple as a signal. And it meant not only your livelihood, but your life. It's pretty important that the farmers have some, some kind of communication, reliable communication. <coughs> Thank you. See, I, I, I wonder if no-till farming is made easier by, by having that signal and, 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 uh, and having that precision equipment. Sure it is. Sure it is. Much easier. Yeah. I mean, you, you, it's like driving a vehicle with a standard transmission or driving a vehicle with an automatic transmission on cruise control. You don't have to think. Really, you just right, sit right, there. Right, right, and no-tail no needs to be more precise because of you know, just how it is. Well, well, because of, for one, the expense of things today, you, you can't really afford a mistake. But also, with the amount of regulation that's focused at the ag community today, you want to you wanna make sure you know what you're doing. Yes, ma'am. So, a uh, question for you, thinking about what this, the dairy alliance that you... Yes, yes. Vermont Dairy Producer Alliance. Yeah. So, when you are trying to solve this problem um, of no cell service, are you talking to the cell companies themselves? Are you, are you, are there any places that are um, coming up with innovative ways to work with cell companies? for agriculture? You, you talk with the cell companies and <clears throat> there are certain areas that it doesn't work well. For example, in we live in Highgate, our farm is in Sheldon on the Highgate line, so we're close to the border and we have farms closer to the border than, than our main farm. And the problem with the signal there is you have to talk to the Canadians because now you're interfering with their airspace. Doesn't seem to be a problem with them crowding their signal down this way. But if, if, you, if you don't have a, a sign-off from the Canadians for your signal that you're trying to utilize so that you can <coughs> make your equipment operate, they, they can, they can uh, charge you a penalty. I mean, you're in violation of uh, FCC regulations. So, so that's a problem, too. So it would be much easier if we had some cell service. I guess just to put a little finer point on it, and it sounds like maybe you don't have this answer, but we're trying to think of all of the ways that we can solve this problem yeah. in rural Vermont. And yeah. I'm just wondering if you your um, your association has had any um, luck or conversations talking with the cell companies about maybe innovative ways to to solve this problem or ways that it's happening in other states. No, we okay. we haven't solved the problem. Well, no, no. <laughs> Just if you've had if you've been able to talk with them. And about and, and and we haven't uh, we haven't been able to address the problem in a a reasonable manner. Economic wise or, or, or service wise. I mean, if you have unlimited funding, there, you can do most anything today. I don't see anybody in this room <laughs> claiming that. That's not, not at this end of the table anyway. <laughs> Mike, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, who, who, who finds you if you access Canadian systems? The Canadians or the FCC? 
Well, I'm not sure, and I hope not to find out, but I assume uh, that they both are going to talk, and, uh, and how much the penalty would be, and, uh, and who imposes it, uh, I suppose they'd have to collaborate, but I'm not sure. Yeah. On our base station, we had to get an FCC license to run at a certain frequency. That helps answer that. Mm -hmm. yeah. To run it at a certain frequency, yes. With radios. But if you if you run it and and it's interfering with the Canadians, okay, yes. Then you, now you're in a different. Oh, so place. so you're talking yeah. about interference with the signal. Uh, with the Canadian signal, yes, as opposed to actually accessing a Canadian signal to do correct. Okay, yeah, he's right. Transmitter. <coughs> I was just reading a little bit about that and meeting. Depending on what level you're transmitting, you may or may not need a That's right. uh, license. Yeah. Um, my question was: Is uh, um, do you need is in looking for alternatives like Representative Sibley was talking about? Um, Ideally, 24/7, 365 is, is what you're looking for. But are there, for you, as an interruptible system, would that work? I mean, times when you need it, times when you don't. We, we wouldn't need it much after the manure spreading ban is imposed. So after the in the so winter, from, up until uh, we we'll call it from, uh, let's say from. December 1st through April 1st. And I don't think that it would be of much value to us. To expand on that, uh, are you talking like nighttime operations? I'm just, what are, yes, I'm wondering. What, are you guys running all night long? Uh, we, oh, we, 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 plan, we plan all night. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, you mentioned your uh, methane digester. Yeah. Uh, does that require any type of high technology through cable or Wi-Fi or cell service? No, we're we're hooked up on the phone line, so that that's hardwired. So we can we we have people in Pennsylvania and we have people in Wisconsin uh, watching what we're doing with the digester engines, uh, and and also I should say, and also in Rutland where Green Mountain Power is set up. Do you, just, do you have DSL to the, is that the technology? Yes. Thank you, Bill. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a little video for you to help you better understand what you've been hearing about all morning. We might have, maybe we should have done this first. <laughs> might have cleared this up for you a little bit. So, and I apologize. This is this is Green Iron. So I'm a John Deere supporter. I apologize to Bill and to Jan. He had to hold his breath and bite his tongue to sit in one of these. Yes, your product description. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. So I have two things I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you this quick little video, which is obviously a John Deere promotional video, but it does kind of outline some of the technology and it will show it to you in use, which is great. And then I'm gonna show you a listing of some of the products that they offer and what they know farmers think is important. And you'll see some of those um, listed on almost any one of their product is very quick reconnection. So everywhere in rural America, dropping signal is a big problem and what's really important in these tractors is that you reconnect as quickly as possible. So that's one of the big features that they offer. So we'll see if this goes. Precision spraying technology. Introducing the next generation of sprayers from John Deere, the all new R4030 and the R4038 sprayers. You're looking at the latest advances in technology, all fully integrated to deliver the most performance and cover more acres in your day. Everything you see here has been designed for peak efficiency and precision. John Deere Section Control, for example, lets you spray only the areas you want. Using TPS information, it automatically turns boom sections on and off around headlands and waterways, eliminating costly overlaps. 
John Deere section control, you'll save input costs. You'll help boost prop yields by assuring on-target application. And you'll help operators apply product more accurately without manual adjustments. The AutoTrack hands-free guidance system delivers amazing pass-to-pass -pass accuracy, greatly reducing driver strain while reducing your input costs. You can easily maintain a consistent boom height above the ground, too. With the Boom Track Pro option, you can boost your application precision from the comfort of your cab. That means fewer adjustments over hilly terrain and greater confidence of spraying precision. You don't have to worry about weather either. John Deere Mobile Weather provides instant, field-specific, on-the-go weather information to help operators make the most of their application effectiveness. All this precision spraying technology is fully integrated and accessible through the GreenStar 32630 display with easy push-button control. These new sprayers come standard with JD Link. Your new sprayer will send real-time updates to your laptop, desktop, or mobile device with information on how it's operating so you can better manage your operation, your staff, and your costs. You can also check on your machine diagnostics with remote display access, which gives owners, managers, and even dealers the ability to view the operator's display remotely. What if your dealer could alert you of potential problems with your machine and start working on answers without any technician's travel expense to your location? That's what you get with Service Advisor Remote. The bigger your fleet, the more it pays to use AgLogic. It's an automated work order management system that helps you manage and improve the productivity of your entire fleet. So I'm, I'm just going to stop there because now we're talking about back-end stuff, more on the tractor itself and so on, which is which is important and that is great. Like literally if your dealer could call you and say, hey, you've got a wheelbarrow going or you know whatever it is or you've got some problem in a sprayer, um, it'll notify you right away and they'll be able to come and um, get you. So. And then the next thing I'm going to show you, so here are some of the things. So see, rapid recovery feature can quickly reacquire lost signals. So obviously that's something that everybody thinks about, they're all worried about. So this is a variety of different products that they offer for guidance of your machine. So these are all just basically software and hardware packages that you can um, download onto your onboard um, computer. Um, but it talks about... Um, Things like uh, dealing with shaded conditions, things you might not think about when you're when you're in the shade with your with your sprayers and um, so on. Obviously, seeing things is different. It talks about hilly terrain um, in Vermont. In a lot of places, you don't have a good sight line. Like normally, if you're going across the field, you can look at one tree and try to go straight. Um, if you're going up a hill, you might not be able to see that over the top. And so this, because it's precision guided, can keep you within that one inch or one and a half inch of where your last row was. And so it's not just important for fertilizer application or pesticide application. It's really important for planting. And then again, this machine will also remember your planting so that when you go to harvest, it knows exactly where to be to harvest exactly correctly. You know, we have those big corn, as you've seen them, with the big teeth basically in each, you know, each uh, corn stalk has to fit into one of those teeth. You get a little bit off, it's not so helpful. Um, but so here's a whole, and so as you get down, you get closer and closer. You get, you go from six inch accuracy to one inch accuracy. Um, and RTK stands for real time kinematic, um, kinematic, um, which is a, a satellite guidance system, is what that actually stands for. Um, and so all of these do use it. Um, and some of these will require subscription services and so on. Um, one of, you know, they look at reduce your overlap, which means you, that you're not going to be uh, spraying a, a fertilizer in the same place twice, which you don't want because that's wasted. Um, and in Vermont, most, most farms of any size, you're, you're doing soil sampling, you're required to do soil sampling, you're importing all those soil samples, all of that input goes to your, if, you, if you're a smaller farm, you have a custom operator come in, if you're a larger farm, you, you probably have your own equipment, that all goes to your, you know, on the Ligus Brothers farm, it goes to our custom applicator, we don't have this stuff ourselves, the custom applicator comes, it's all downloaded, and when they go out on, onto our field, they, it, their booms are turning on and off and individual sprayers are turning on and off depending on what we need. And that goes not only for fertilizer and pesticides, it also goes um, for manure handling as well. So when somebody goes out and sprays, they know where they're spraying and you know where they're supposed to be on that field. And some of our fields only, you know, the northwest quadrant of a field actually needs manure this year um, because our phosphorus levels or our nitrogen levels are all fine, so we don't need that. Um, and so everything is just a lot more precise with this kind of technology. Um, and it was important for us to come to your committee and let you know that because I think most people don't think of farms 
and this level of precision that is out there. But um, with with regulations the way they are today, we have to be very, very precise in how we're using our inputs, not only to remain economically <coughs> viable, but to remain within the law, within our regulatory standards of what we are allowed to apply to fields. Um, other ways that we are using technology on the farm, for instance, you go by farms and you'll see those plastic curtains. For the vast majority of farmers, those are connected to thermometers and they go up and down um, based on, on temperature because cows like it to be cold, like 52 degrees is kind of ideal for a cow. They're ruminants, they produce a lot of heat, they don't like the heat at all. Um, fan systems, um, mister uh, systems inside of barns are all uh, automatically controlled. You don't have to go like, oh, I'm hot, let's go turn on the, on the mister system. Those things are all pretty much automated on farms today. For people who use robotic milkers, those robotic milkers are always talking to the cell phone of the operator, because the operator doesn't have to be there. But if something's going on, even if it's something with a cow that's going on, a cow that normally comes in and stands still, like that robotic milker will remember every single cow based on its transponder when it comes in. It'll remember her and her level of activity when she's getting milk. So, so today she comes in and she's you know stomping her feet or moving around a little bit. That operator can know if you want to, you can you know tell say tell me these kinds of inputs, and it'll let you know. There's a reason that cow's agitated. She doesn't feel well. There's something going on. Cows are very competitive. She could be literally being bullied. We have a lot of bullies in a in a dairy herd. Um, one of the early technologies was cows wore a transponder in their ear. They'd go up to a feeder. The feeder would open. She'd walk in. She'd get fed. And so this was like this very precise technology. It was supposed to be a great way to, to feed your cow. And they couldn't overeat, et cetera. Well, then we, what we discovered over time is on a lot of farms, there'd be a bully cow. And some non-bully cow, some submissive cow, would go in. The food would drop down. And the bully cow would just feed her. And then she'd back out to get out of the way, and the bully cow would go in and eat the leftover food from the other cow. And then so we, you notice some really big fat cows and some kind of getting skinnier <laughs> cows out there. So there, there, you know, we've tried a lot of different types of technology on farms, and some work and some don't. But it's um, it's been really, really interesting. Um, we use um, some farms use extended day lighting. You know, as it gets darker here. The, the, the more light it is, the more your cows are going to get up and eat and drink, and obviously that improves um, their production. Um, you want cows, cows wear uh, pedometers now, a lot of cows wear pedometers, um, almost for the opposite reason that humans do. We don't want them to walk around a lot. We want them to be, you know, lazy and, you know, just eating and drinking and then lying down and chewing your cud and then getting up and being milked. We, really, we don't want any extra activity out there. Um, and so those things can also let you know, this cow's walking around a lot, like she's agitated and she could be in heat, it's time to breed her. You know, there's, there are reasons that a cow, cows are huge, huge habitual creatures. They want to do the same thing every day. Um, you, you move a fence, you move something, it can throw your entire day off for a whole bunch of cows because they don't like anything change. They like everything the same every single day. Um, and so those, something like wearing some kind of a pedometer can really tell you a lot about how your cow is feeling and what's going on. Um, so that did talk about the weather conditions. They talked about that. And so um, the, the newest technology is that you punch in. These are the products that I'm using. Those products all have a safety label. Those safety labels can tell you that you can't apply with certain wind speeds. You, you, know, you need a certain level of humidity. Um, and also, as you're watching your weather, certain products, like we hear some about glyphosate, breaks down in sunlight, but you need a certain amount of sunlight for it to work. Um, and so if, if cloudy weather is coming in, it can tell you that. And it'll say, you know, you've got two hours left to be using this product, and then it's, you know, you're going to get much less um, of its effectiveness um, because of a changing weather condition. Um, just to let you know, this is a big deal for farmers, the Franklin uh, Grand Isle uh, farmers group is uh, holding a precision, precision ag meeting um, this Friday. It's an all-day meeting up at the Abbey, um, and this is exactly what they're talking about. And this is what farmers are, are really focusing on. You know, we, in order to compete, we're competing in a global marketplace. We need to follow and be able to use these technologies. And so it is um, really, really important um, that we're allowed to do these kinds of things. Um, and anything that Vermont can do to help. And I can tell you, you call Verizon or you call AT&T and you say, oh, I'm, you know, farmer group in Vermont, they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, look at our map. The map says you have coverage. Well, I can guarantee you we don't have coverage. So um, so it is it is a big <laughs> issue. But trust me, they don't really care about some dairy group in Vermont calling them up. Even if you're, you know, you call your local Verizon store and what they'll tell you is we don't control what you know, towers are going up and we don't know any new towers are coming in or, you know, they don't. It's just not on their radar, really. Cell phone coverage. Yes. That's what we need. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. And so a lot of this RTK is actually is um, satellite, and so you can have satellite phones and you know that kind of stuff. But it is, you know, as you've heard today, you buy those subscriptions and they are expensive. Um, so it would be a lot better if we had cell phone coverage, and then you would still buy the subscriptions, but you wouldn't need the satellites. Satellites are going to be a lot less precise than if you had local cell phone coverage and you could use the GPS guidance systems like you want to. Thank you, Margaret. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Meg Nelson. I represent Northeast Agribusiness and Feed Alliance, and my husband and I have a dairy farm in St. Albans. Um, to start, I'm going to show you a video that our farm, um, in collaboration with another farm, made with uh, Must Be the Milk two years ago that demonstrates a lot of the technologies that we use currently and uh, a lot of the ag uh, industry is really taking on to uh, make, make milk. Everybody thinks of a farm that it's a pitchfork, it's a hay bale, and it's an old rusty tractor. Well, on this farm, it's not the case. Yeah, technology is a big part of, you know, I think successful farming. Every cow wears a collar, we get all this information. We have <coughs> currently 30 cameras across <coughs> farms that allow us to see which cows need more food or when cows are running out of feed and so that we can manage them from our smartphone anywhere. They can roam around in here. They can go up and eat at the feeder when they want to. They have a little computer chip and they can go into the feeder several times throughout the day and get fed. We have four robots in here working 24 hours a day. You know, the cows going through the gates, nobody's pushing on them, so they kind of go at their own pace, so there's not a stressor to them. This guy pushes the feed back up to the cows. The cows, as they eat, they root around and push the feed around, and it works its way out, and this guy pushes it back up. The GPS auto track system on the tractor allows us to do more with less, so as the tractor drives itself, it can make sure that every row of corn is essentially perfectly spaced so that it drastically reduces the weight. So one way we keep track of what we're putting on the land is an app that I have. It's a nitrogen management tool. We uh, invested in a drone in the beginning of the summer. One of the major positives that we had right away was being able to fly over our cornfields. On our farm, we own and operate a methane digester. Our farm actually exports four times the power that it consumes. At the foundation of what we do is quality and health and comfort for our animals, animal welfare, the environment. We are the first and foremost stewards of the land, and we're proud of that. Nice job, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. All right, so those are some of the technologies. <laughs> Not a hit cancel. <laughs> uh, that we're using from drones to milking, uh, harvesters that are all, all automated, robotic calf feeding. Uh, we have a methane digester. Those all need a communication platform to speak sometimes to each other and to the farmer. Um, so one thing we find, we have a lot of dead zones that will be on our, on our smartphones looking at cows and then bam, we're, we're lost connection and we have to wait or drive to find a better spot. Um, so just being connected is going to be really important for the rural uh, communities of Vermont because that's where our agribusiness is happening. And as we are trying to do more with less and constantly honing in and becoming more and more precise and using less water and, and less inputs, we're also improving our output. So, so some of the things that uh, farmers are doing are very beneficial to Vermont, and we need to be connected in order to continue doing what we're doing. So I'm just curious about the different um, uh, connectivity um, 
applications that you have coming into your farm. Um, you, you clearly mentioned cell phone and mm -hmm. spottiness and, and the importance of that. Do you have a broadband connection coming into your we do. property? We do. That um, is just through Comcast. It's expensive, but when we're out in the fields, when my husband's uh, planting corn all night and such, he'll be out there and he'll be trying to log in with his smartphone to whether check on a cow or we have real-time milking data, so we'll have a, it's basically a virtual parlor where the cows are getting milked and something might be going wrong and he's getting an alarm, but he can't access the computer to fix that um, so the, the milkers can keep milking. And that's more of a cell phone issue. That is more of a cell phone issue, yeah. I would say that broadband is, um, it can be really, really expensive for rural um, communities and, and getting it out there. Um, and finding good quality, so that will be something to address as well. But for us, uh, really, cell phone coverage is, is a really big one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, yeah, so you said you're up in St. Albans, right? Mm -hmm. How far outside the uh, city limits is your farm? So we're about five miles. We're from, from the city. We're right in the bay, right, on, um, right close to Macquam Shore Road, and we're. Uh, pretty close to Canada as well. A lot of our fields are actually up in Swanton, and we will roam and uh, get dinged on our, our cell phone bill. will go up substantially when, when that happens. Uh, we have called AT&T about that, and they just say, oh, well, Canada's uh, towers are stronger. Sorry. We're, so we actually have plans on our cell phones that cost us an extra $10 a month to uh, be able to roam if, if needed when that happens, so, so it's not $300 a month. Hmm. And Verizon actually doesn't charge for that. That is some we deal with the same thing anywhere in the northern part, and Verizon will not charge you to ding off of Rogers in Canada. No. Yeah, we've looked into switching, and uh, where we are, we, we've had uh, employees that have had Verizon and had a, a little harder of a time with coverage, so we, we stuck with AT&T for now. But we were always shopping around to find the best connection. Seth, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, I thought there was uh, some sort of FCC rule, like if you didn't actually cross the border, they were supposed to refund that. Um, we called, and they always they always ding you. Yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> we wish that was the case. Plus, I think when this originally happened, we moved to the area five years ago, and the first couple times they, they kind of waived it, but then they see that, oh, we're calling all the time and having this issue, and so it ended up just being more logical to put the extra plan on our cell phones. If we have time, this is totally unrelated to connectivity, but it's about the digester. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Um, so uh, what, what happens to the waste from the digester? The in product? So um, I mean, after the manure is digested, it's separated, mm -hmm. uh, the solids out at about 35% dry matter and we use that underneath the cows as bedding because it is cooked it's pretty it, a lot of the pathogens are killed and it's very comfortable and great closed loop system and then the slurry that's left over is spread onto our fields this year we are actually investing in a drag line like Will was talking about and we'll be able to uh, spread quickly less compaction and getting a really accurate rate on the fields and what happens to the bedding material? It's just recycled. It whatever. So it's it's in the stalls where the cows are laying, and after so long, the cows will kind of kick it out, and it will be uh, put back into the manure system, and it will just keep going in the in the loop. Okay, so far this has been the most interesting hearing. You want to create committees. So do. <laughs> so this is what happens when you talk to people who know their So I'm sorry. So we're, we're talking about infrastructure. And, and you know when infrastructure or the lack of infrastructure first really hit me between the eyes was when we put our digester in. We were 3.2 miles from a substation on single phase, and we had to build 3.2 miles of three phase power lines. Yeah. <laughs> Eighty thousand dollars a mile. Yeah. Oh. Jeez. <laughs> For the privilege of producing power. Yeah. And that's when you say, "Good God, how did we get caught like this?" Yeah. yeah. But that's just a good example of inadequate infrastructure, and mm -hmm. the cell phone service is no different. 
we can't fully utilize what we're trying to do with the equipment that's capable of doing it. So we need some help. Yeah. Yep. Uh, may I? You may. Uh, you know, I would just note in the case of the uh, electrical lines, you had the option to build those. No, that's that's true. Yeah. That, that's correct. As opposed to self Don't have the right. option. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> you can build your own cell tower if you want. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so um, uh, next we're going to hear uh, from Jeff. You were scheduled for 1130. Is, is there any chance we could hear from you a little bit earlier? Yeah. Okay. So why don't we take literally a five minute break just so people can kind of reorient themselves here. Um, but why don't we start with you in five minutes, Jeff, if that works. For the record, I'm Jeff Austin, Director of External Affairs and Government Affairs at Consolidated Communications. Uh, thank you very much for the time today, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, that's hard to follow up on that. The <laughs> I know a lot of those folks, so uh, it's always good to see those folks in here. Um, I, I wanted to just start, I actually have four things, um, just kind of topics that I wanted to review today. Um, and, you know, those are basically fast internet access around Vermont and, and investment. I thought those were two good things to put together. Uh, reliable connectivity, 911 calling, just to kind of review that um, real quick. Um, attentive customer service and make ready timeliness and transparency. Just a few things I wanted to talk about. If, I, But I didn't know if the, anyone from the committee had any questions for me to start with. Or I know that um, on the calendar it said Universal Service Fund. So I just wanted to make sure we covered all, you know, what you wanted to. Because yep. um, as you know, I can talk. And I didn't want to run out of time before yeah. we got to what you wanted to address. Yeah. For sure. Generally speaking, you know, some of the things that we're focusing on this week and next week um, it relate to uh, the Universal Service Fund. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, one of the things that we're considering as part of a broadband bill is um, you know, potentially some more revenue coming into the state from that, from that resource. Yep. So that, that's why that's um, kind of high on our list. But um, you're certainly welcome to address those other things as well. Sure. And I just want to let you know, I, I would support, you know, the half percent increase for the four years on Universal Service Fund. I know this was something um, that we had, a, you know, last year, the year before. Um, that hasn't changed in our support of that. So I just wanted to at least address that in the beginning. Um, I also have just... Just show and tell, just real quick, if, I, if um, you can give me a second. Um, there's copper and fiber, and I know we talk a lot about that kind of in the committee as it relates to providing service. Uh, but I kind of wanted to just pass these around, if you guys wanted to look at them real quick, um, the difference between the two. I, we don't, I can talk while you guys are looking at this. Um, but this is a copper cable. This is a 100 bare copper cable. It's got 200 wires in it. You can see all of the, the copper network was built. With the resilient, we've got metal coating around the copper. We've got um, thick plastic coating. That's why when a tree falls, you don't necessarily go out of service. Uh, that's why you may see a tree on a copper line and it may look like a, a V, but people are still in service. It may be on the ground and people are still in service. Um, the, way this, the, the way that we built this and the way that it was manufactured. Uh, just be careful on this end. It's a little sharp, so if you want to kind of look at it. This is a 12 fiber. Um, drop we, and it has 12 fibers in it, individual fibers. It's called a ribbon, um, and then that just gives you a better idea. Most fibers, just so you know, when you're looking, them, looking at them on the pole, probably have 72 or 144 of these in there. This just happens to have 12 for illustrative purposes. But I just wanted to show you guys if you wanted to take a look at What's the comparative carrying capacity of those two? The copper has a, well, the way that we build the network, it's built for northern and storm heavy loading. So the way you ultimately build the network is you have two poles, um, you put brackets on the poles, and you run a 10 millimeter um, metal strand, a very thick metal strand that, that can hold a lot of weight. Then you take a metal lashing, and you take the copper, and you lash that to the metal strand. So the metal strand is actually what's holding everything together. Um, and it has, you know, extremely high loading. I meant that I didn't mean physical load. Oh, I'm meant, sorry. See, engineer, sorry. Carrying, okay, uh, <laughs> fair enough. Transmission capacity. Oh, transmission capacity. Um, I don't the, know if that's the right. Oh, no, that's a great one. The fiber, almost unlimited. It depends on the electronics that you put on the end of it. Um, so each of those fibers, even today, um, everywhere we have fiber, you could get a carrier Ethernet service. It's our carrier class service <clears throat> for businesses at a 10 gig level. 
um, for internet service or point-to-point -point connectivity or multi-point connectivity. Are these equivalent? Um, no, absolutely not. No, the 100 pair copper cable can serve 100 separate customers. The fiber, the 12 fiber that you have there, you know, could potentially serve 500 customers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Is that the, <laughs> thank you very I much. I think we get there. <laughs> so just, I wanted to start with just internet access, um, as we were, we're talking about the Universal Service Fund and, and investment. One thing that is um, the reality of the world that we live in is we're constantly building. So just so you know, this is not a, a static environment. Every single day we're out, we're building fiber, we're expanding, we're extending fiber further closer to customers, we're building fiber to the prem, um, we are building remote terminals, we're building more electronics, and that's kind of on the outside. Inside, we have a humongous network, the whole PSTN, when people say the PSTN, that's what we run. We have a whole network with multiple gate connections connecting our 90 central offices in Vermont. Um, to make sure everything runs. And we also have different carriers uh, that are in our buildings. Everybody kind of connects to the PSTN. So we've got the entire network to maintain and we're out investing and we're building and we're constantly expanding. One of the things we did in 2018 as it relates to broadband expansion is we, this was an internal initiative. Uh, we increased speeds to 100,000 addresses just in Vermont, uh, 500,000 between Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont. So as Consolidated come, came in, uh, took over obviously the company, this was one of our initiatives, um, you know, with the new company is to build out more broadband. So we did that. We're also obviously building out with our CAF funds. We've got Vermont connectivity grants. We have a lot of projects um, related and our own investments where we're building. I know, I think I mentioned this before, but I think it's worth kind of just reiterating. As this build out continues, we've done a lot since 2011 from, in Vermont, over $100 million in, in investments. Uh, we've done over 785 remote terminal build outs. That's fiber to an area out in a remote area, and fiber to electronics, and the copper that actually runs to your house is connected to those electronics. 650 of those are actually in rural Vermont. They might be in downtown Barnett, but still, as you kind of think about the rural areas, um, you know, I included kind of those downtown rural areas in, in that 650. So we've extended, we built 2,600 miles of fiber since 2011 just in Vermont. A lot of that fiber, whether it's connecting a cell tower, which happens to be in rural areas, um, or connecting to remote terminals, or connecting to our customers, our businesses, um, all of that fiber is capable of providing service to customers. So it's not just central office to central office connecting our network. All the fiber we have out there is, is capable of providing anything to any of our customers. So we continue to build out. And as we're talking about speeds, since 2016, uh, the technology that we're using, it's DSL, uh, but it's VDSL to technology. This is very high bit rate DSL. Um, it's still distance sensitive. Uh, it still has that last mile that runs over the copper, you know, like we talked about. Um, but we're able to get speeds up to 80 meg download uh, out of a lot of those. The newer thing since 2016, we're able to get um, 100 meg download. It's 40 meg upload. I know the upload is very important also. So these are 80 by 20, um, 100 by 40. Now, some of the stuff that we're building in our central offices also allows for fiber to the prem deployments. We have seven fiber to the prem deployment projects going on right now. One was completed in South Burlington. We have two in Mooresville. Duxbury, um, we have one in Essex we have going on. So we have this, so as we relate to new build outs or new buildings or multi-dwelling units, or if we're out there and we end up having to potentially replace uh, the copper that's out there, we're looking at it at all angles, all technologies, what makes sense. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah. Just a quick question, yeah, yeah. question. The South Burlington and Essex um, projects that you have, is that replacing copper? No, that's actually in brand new developments. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. So ultimately, like I said, I just wanted to um, just illustrate, it's a very, very dynamic <coughs> out there. And we're always building and investing. Um, we have a commitment uh, based on the consolidated acquisition to reinvest 14% of our Vermont revenues each year, 2018, 19, and 20, back into the Vermont network. Um, I, I can't tell you that exact amount, um, you know, as it relates to that revenue, but I can tell you in 2018, 
uh, we exceeded that revenue goal by about $3 million. So, um, Jeff, you mentioned building um, 2,600 miles of fiber. Yep. And I'm just wondering is, uh, and you said not all of it is like to uh, backhaul. Correct. That's um, a great point. Yep. So, but I'm wondering about backhaul and, and overbuilding and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so I hear you have a lot of fiber and VTEL has a lot of fiber, and VTrans has fiber, and Velco has fiber, and it seems like there's a lot of redundancy. And I'm just wondering, how much do you lease from other people? How much do you lease to other people? How much do you just build so you have your own and don't want to mess with other people's? Can you sure. address that? That's a great question. The, as it relates to Velco, Velco on their high power lines is usually all by themselves. Um, so they have a lot of fiber, uh, but they have it on their own facilities. Um, so, uh, you know, relates to those. There's other companies, just to give you an idea, First Light, a uh, big company here, CenturyLink, who purchased Level 3, uh, First Light purchased Sovereignet. So you even have more and more people on, on the poles with fiber. So between 2011 and now, for the most part, we build our own fiber. We have the infrastructure, we go out, we have, and we lash to our existing plant where we need to build. Um, we have partnered with the Vermont Department of Public Service. We do lease some dark fiber, um, and I can explain if you guys wanted to know what dark fiber is, but we lease some dark fiber from the Department of Public Service. Um, we do have companies that come to us that ask us to lease them dark fiber. Um, wireless care, a lot of different companies. Um, you know, we're kind of, because if you end up having fiber in your location here, point A and point B, and you have the electronics to connect on both, you can do whatever you want to do over that fiber. Um, you don't have to purchase, you're purchasing the dark fiber, but it's unlimited. You can do whatever your equipment will allow you to do. Um, so as a general as a general practice, we don't lease a lot of dark fiber from other companies um, because we, we have a ton of fiber in the state already. When it makes business sense, we're certainly in those conversations. So as we kind of get going on the questions here, I want to be um, mm -hmm. cognizant of the amount of time, but sure. uh, Mike, and that's kind of great. Yeah, so um, I'm not too familiar with uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of speeds Consolidated Communications provides in the Shelburne area. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that when you get into the Shelburne Village, it's pretty good. I have... Uh, constituents who are in Charlotte but are still served by consolidated. They're right on the edge of the uh, boundary between Waitsfield, Champlain Valley Telecom and consolidated. Mm -hmm. And they got lousy service. They got, you know, four, four one DSL mm -hmm. basically. What what does it take to get them better service? Well it would potentially take different electronics. Uh, we may have to build more fiber closer to them to put in electronics. Um, or some fiber of the prime probably solution at and, that point. And, so there's a couple options. And, and my question really is, how do you make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you have to balance. You have to balance the entire yeah. business. So <clears throat> as we're out building broadband, um, we're also an operating company. So we're out doing AOT projects. Last year we did 8,000 hours of non-reimbursable AOT work. Uh, we're doing bank ready, we're doing installation and repair for our customers. So what you look at is you look at what do we have for a bulk workload? What does the entire workload look like? Where are we building out? We have commitments like our CAF2 commitments. Uh, we have commitments with the Department of Public Service to build out broadband. So you look at all your commitments um, and then you figure out, okay, what can you do? What can you realistically do in a year? Also, we meet with towns. For example, the town of Shelburne, if they wanted to meet, <coughs> We meet with towns, talk to them about what they have for service, where they have it, where the fiber is, and how do you, where they have concerns about certain areas, and then how do we work together potentially on a public-private partnership to solve for that issue. So one of the problems may be that, um, that since these, uh, these clients of yours are in Charlotte, mm -hmm. Shelburne service may be very good, you know, for, so, so Shelburne, the town of Shelburne doesn't have any interest in actually getting mm -hmm. consolidated to serve the people in Charlotte sure. who are just over the border but are connected through consolidated through the telephone lines. 
I have a, just a good example. It's a recent example. Um, I met with the town of Barnett a couple months ago, and and it wasn't the town. It was actually townspeople in a room like this. They made pizza. It was great. And we talked about that exact same issue. The town of Barnett has good service. The outskirts on Morrison Road and Strowbridge Road, there was no service in that area. So they we had a very specific conversation on how do we fix this problem? Um, and what we ended up doing, and this is actually very interesting, I mentioned public-private partnerships. The, we were gonna apply jointly for a grant, a connectivity grant from the Department of Public Service. The town, these folks in this community got together and they raised money that, will also, that could ultimately support the build out if we're awarded that grant. So that's the first time we've been involved in that. We've been through this grant process maybe four times, um, but we really used a grassroots effort to say, okay, we're gonna bid for it. We're gonna put in for it. But if we can get help on the, you know, if we can get some financial assistance, it just makes the case look better. So it really was on the grassroots side. We applied, um, they have not awarded those yet, so we're still waiting to hear uh, if we were awarded that. But it's those types of conversations when you get to those areas um, that I think have to be really on that level. And, and for example, if those folks wanted to meet and kind of do the exact same thing we did in Barnett, those are the conversations uh, that we're absolutely involved in. And this actually is kind of a good segue, it kind of takes me off of where I was going, but a little bit of a good segue. We are working, and our, and our vice president of products working on this. We're working with the town of Chesterfield, New Hampshire right now on a broadband bonding project. They actually put some legislation in uh, New Hampshire last year that allows for municipal broadband bonding. And Chesterfield, New Hampshire is the first one who's kind of getting to the point where they put out an RFP, we worked with them, responded to it, we won the RFP. This is an entire town of fiber of the prem. That it has to go in front of the, the town's folks on, on vote, you know, on voting day. So they have to vote for it, which makes sense. But ultimately, we're it's that those kind of discussions um, that we're looking to hopefully hopefully replicate. <coughs> if we can make that a transferable model, that's great to actually go out and have these other conversations. Every town would be a little bit different because every town is different. But if you have the basic bond model together, then you have you have the tool to get you to the next conversation. Um, so that's something that we're doing right now, too. And you can give me uh, a name of someone to contact for that kind of conversation. Yeah, yeah, actually, I would be happy to. I do that as my side job. <laughs> Great. Oh, I was just going to ask, again, for a definition of dark fiber. Oh, okay. right. Right. so. I'm sure it's been explained before, but I don't have it. Oh, no, it's actually, so fiber, you put light on fiber, and so usually when it's working, actually there's light going through the fiber. So, oh, and, the, and we're putting the light on it. Dark fiber is if you have a company, um, you know, I'm trying to find an example, but if you have a company who has a business in um, Essex, and they also have a business in Jericho, not that far apart, and they want to connect, they just want to share data between those two different, those two different offices. They could at least start fiber. They could take one or two fibers um, they, that we are not using. So it's just unused fiber. It's unused fiber. That's all it is. They light it up with their own, you know, with their own equipment and their own data. But we're just giving them fibers that we're that are just dark that are yeah. that have no light on. So lit, lit fiber means when uh, the the service provider puts the equipment on the end and they select a particular um, light frequency um, to control the amount of throughput and so forth. Dark fiber means, hey, here's a piece of fiber, you get both ends of it, do whatever you want with it. So it, it means that fiber can never be used for anything else. Um, so you've got to lease the entire fiber capacity, um, but it also means that you're entirely in control of what equipment you put on either end and what you send through it. And, and as long as we're asking mm -hmm. elementary questions, the capacity of one Strand of fiber is sky's the limit. It's um it's limited only to the equipment and lasers that emit the light on the ends of that fiber. I think we're up to thirty terabytes per <laughs> strand. It's a I mean it is it really is unlimited. As much light as you can put over it. Yeah. And climbing. And climbing. <laughs> and yes. Thank you. Thank you.
So that I just that was kind of my review on investments and you know internet access. Um, like right now, we have sixty current projects that we're working on in Vermont. Um, most of those are related to either VDSL deployment or, like I mentioned, those fiber to the front deployments that we have going on now. Um, I did want to jump into just reliability, reliable connectivity, nine one one calling. Um, I think it's important, obviously, just to start off. If you called Consolidated today, for example, and you were looking for a repair on your residential phone, your business phone, whatever that may be, um, we we have a schedule that we would be out there by close business tomorrow. You know, this is that's usually as it relates to our requirements and as it relates to our resources um, and the amount of trouble tickets we have currently. That's our response time. Now, six months ago, that was not our response time. Uh, we actually did experience unacceptable wait times for repair and installation. Um, hence, we have a service quality investigation going on right now with the Public Utility Commission. Um, we're working very closely with the Department of Public Service and the PUC um, to kind of work through that process. And, but I did kind of want to bring that up. One, you know, one of the things is we, have, we had a collective bargaining agreement that we were working through um, in August. Just real quick on that to allow flexibility um, to, to handle those peak workload periods. Um, so that's been, you know, that was successfully negotiated with our IBW and CWA unions. That gives us a flexibility to bring in third party resources, you know, um, from, from different companies <laughs> like contractors basically uh, to help with those peak workloads. Um, another thing that we're doing though is we're hiring additional technicians here in Vermont. Um, so we've got that already in the mix. That's what's going on today. And these are, yes. Oh. Yeah. Just a quick question. Is the response time, is that for telephone service, for DSL, for both? For both right now. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, how many technicians are you hiring? Um, eight, that would be 18. And uh, what will that put you at uh, as compared to five years ago in terms of overall technicians? I don't have that number compared to five years ago. Will it be more or less or the same? That the overall number of full-time employees, as it relates to technicians, technicians. Um, might be less, but with the flexibility, for example, we have over 30 third-party contractors in today. Uh, when you look at the net number, it would ultimately be more. So, just to confirm, mm -hmm. I think what I just heard you say is you're hiring 18. Uh, you're not exactly sure if that would be more or less, but you think it may be less than what you had five years ago after you hire 18. So not counting our third party contractor resources. Uh, but I don't have those numbers specifically, just to be clear. Um, now, so service quality, obviously, like I said, those, un, um, those unacceptable wait times. This is, we've gone through um, an entire operational reconstruction um, where we have new leadership through the entire operational workforce. And, you know, during this time, we did bring in folks. We do have the ability to move some of our technicians from other states. We had folks in from Maine, we had folks in from New Hampshire, we had folks in from Pennsylvania, California, Illinois, Minnesota. We were bringing in folks, because um, one of the things that happened, and just, get, just to kind of throw this out there um, in transparency, is once the, the, the contract was ratified, we were able to bring in third party contractors. Well, that was around beginning of September, uh, late August in that beginning of September. Well, then you have a couple hurricanes that happen. And you know, sometimes these contractor resources, there's, there's a limited amount, go to the storm recovery areas. That's why we're bringing in additional resources from other states uh, to assist with that. Um, but since that period of time, uh, we've made steady progress, reducing the volumes back to normal workload volumes. Today, for example, in the entire state of Vermont, we have about 116 uh, voice and DSO, you know, trouble tickets in the state. Um, where we actually had made really good progress till the end of November when they were, you know, the southern part of the state got hit with a really bad storm. Uh, that put us back several weeks of storm recovery, getting things working. Um, but at this, like I said, um, within a few weeks after that storm and we recovered from that, all our service quality is, um, as it relates to uh, response times, you know, has been at normal levels during this period of the year. Um. The, uh, the PUC and, and Consolidated just settled a, um, I don't know what you, a settlement, a stipulation in, in the 
related to the E911? Yep. Of no open docket. Yep. Yep. Can you address that? Sure. A little bit. Yep. So um, there was an, back in January of 2016, um, there was an issue where the 911, there was a, a network issue, I'll uh, keep it high level, where calls to 911 were not routed the appropriate way. Um, no calls were lost to 911. 911 has several different paths that it takes when you make a 911 call to get to the call taker. Um, so in November of 2016, the PUC opened up an investigation related to that incident. Um, and what we did is we ended up working closely with the Department of Public Service to go through, we, they hired an external consultant um, and we worked very closely with all of those folks to go through what happened, um, go through the entire, these are experts going through the entire network. Um, we, we actually had three face-to-face -face meetings like this with the consultants and the Department of Public Service to review you know, what happened uh, in those situations. The Because there were two others that rolled into the, yep. the same investigation, right? Yes, um, there was, and let me see if I can get these right, there was March 2018, because we're in 2019, and the November of 2017. Uh, so they, there were two issues. One of those was related to you know a network you know, change that we had made. We're actually building in some redundancy as it relates to robocalling. Um, but those were added into that. And as we work through with the Department of Public Service and their consultants, um, you go through the process. They end up submitting a report related to everything you know that they reviewed with us um, and recommendations uh, to whether it's labeling of something or record keeping or with tickets, they really just kind of put out what their recommendations would be to make sure um, that they were comfortable, that we had made the changes so things like that wouldn't happen again. So that report came in, uh, worked with the Department of Public Service on a, on a stipulation agreement, which includes some of the network that we have as it relates to the transmission of 911 calls and voice calls in general. We're building a new network behind the network that we have today. Installing that redundancy that mm -hmm. wasn't there. Yep. Yeah. So ultimately, this will be this will be the ultimate network that when we transition all of the, our legacy voice services, I guess for the lack of a better term, over to more of a voice over IP platform. Um, this is the network that will ultimately carry the 911 traffic and, and a lot of other traffic also. And so ultimately, like I, I just wanted to kind of bring that up. That is something we're working with the Department of Public Service. We have worked on it very hard. It's been in, um, the major focus of the company, improving our service quality, um, hiring more technicians, getting the third party resources here, um, and really increasing our responsiveness to our customers because really that's, that's really where, what matters. Um, hey, Jeff, I got a question. Sure. Um, so in regards to sort of the copper versus the fiber, mm -hmm. Um, let's say you have a, a low bed go through with an excavator on it, it wipes out the line. Yep. What are we talking about for differences, repairs, and, and can there be a joining of the two, or is it only copper and only fiber? I mean, how does that, how does that work? The, the only time that you can join them is if you have electronics in between them. So you have to have something there to convert that optical fiber signal over to an electrical copper signal. So if you have something in between it, that's where it all joins together. But if you're on a pole and an excavator rips your stuff down, um, you there's benefits and challenges of both, right? So if it rips down the copper, you're going to go out there, you're going to run a new copper between the two locations. You're going to you're going to cut it off here, cut it off here, run a new copper. You're going to take every one of those wires and splice it into its corresponding wire. So that can be more time consuming. But you're going to do all of that in the air. You're going to have uh, technicians and bucket trucks, and they're going to be working on that in the air. The fiber needs special equipment to splice it together, and it also needs an environment where it, where you have a clean environment. Most of the time with the fiber splicing, we actually have to bring the one end of the fiber in and the other end of the fiber in a truck. The back, actually, it's a trailer. The back end of a trailer, and we have to splice it with specific splicing gear, and it has to be it has to be perfectly clean and flawless. So it's more time consuming to probably splice the, fiber, the copper, but you're doing it in the air and you're doing it as it is. And once you connect one end and you're connecting the other end, people are coming back in service as you're actually splicing it together. The fiber, you gotta pull it down, do it in a truck. In the end, it's probably similar, okay. um, but those are the, kind of the differences on how that works. Thanks. Cool.
talking to you briefly, Jeff. Mm -hmm. The technicians, uh, are those same people doing installation, repair, make ready work? Or are there different types of people doing those three types of work? Yeah, that's a great question. These, they are different people. Um, the installation and repair folks are the same people. Um, and the people who actually splice those things together, like we just talked about, those are the same people. The folks who are doing the make ready work are, we call them our outside plant technicians, they're our linemen. They're the ones putting poles in, they're the ones who are actually, they build it and everybody else um, connects it and keeps it running. And yep. so the 18 that you're adding are the install repair. Correct. And what is the uh, lineman, uh, what is your lineman um, employee level looking like? Is that up, down, the same from five years ago? Uh, from five, actions, I can say I believe from three years ago, um, we're down about two linemen in the same. Okay, yep. thank you. So Jeff, we've got about a couple more minutes. Okay, yeah. so um, I think um, just to, to, to importantly, oh, and like I said, these these jobs that we're adding, these are highly technical, you know, uh, important jobs, you know, for us and for Vermont. Um, after two or three years on that on that level of uh, technician, the the wages and benefit packages, um, these are you know over a hundred thousand dollars a year. These are really good, you know, jobs that we're creating here in Vermont. Um, one of the things I just wanted to mention because. Um, there's been some talk about make ready. Um, they actually, the PUC did order a rulemaking uh, on the make ready practice. But just about make ready timeliness and transparency. One of the things, there's a rule out there, rule 3700. There's also tariff 26. There's a whole, there's all the rules obviously related to uh, make ready process and pool attachments. Um, one of the things that when we're talking about responsiveness and timeliness, I'll, I'll just take EC Fiber for example. Um, about two, maybe two and a half years ago, we started having bi-weekly calls with EC Fiber. So, it, and actually five, at least five resources from Consolidator on those bi-weekly calls. And these calls are talking about specifically what we're doing, where we're doing it, where they need it. Um, it, it it's very, it's actually a very high level of coordination. This is combined with a weekly call or bi-weekly call we have internally. So we have our internal call, then we have our bi-weekly bi -weekly calls with EC Fiber. So as it relates to transparency, um, you know, and we do this with other companies if they're having large builds, because we need to stay on top, everybody needs to stay on top of what we're doing. Those calls are with Green Mountain Power also. Um, so, and because that's where EC Fiber's, you know, building is in the Green Mountain Power area. So we have bi-weekly calls with them. Um, they do the time frame to do the make ready. Um, once you get the check to do the make ready, it's 120 days. Um, the, we have, back in 2017, we did have delays. I know um, Irv Tomei uh, had mentioned that. Some of that was related to just kind of prioritizing. One of the things we did on our bi-weekly calls is we said, okay, you've got six towns here that you have make ready requests for. Which one do you want us to focus on? Because obviously, when you're building a fiber of the prime network or any network, you're gonna start in one area, and then you're just gonna kind of continue to build out. You're not gonna build out a little bit here and a little bit there. So we work closely with them to figure out, okay, we know some of these dates are going to go by. You know, they're going to be longer than 120 days. But where do you want us to focus on? So as it relates to the overall picture, you know, for example, the 120 days since 2015 to now are average. And, and I'll say all day because I see these numbers, and I've been on all of these calls with EC Fiber, that some of these were way over 120 days. But if you're looking at the average, um, we've had two, we have 176 applications that required make ready. 353 pools, we had to set. This is just us, this doesn't include what GMP had to set. 3,100 loaners, you know, there's a significant amount of work there. And we've averaged 91 days. Um, some of those we were able to do really quickly, obviously. Uh, some of those we, we had longer time frames. And Irv is right, some of those were, you know, 200 days over the 120 days. Uh, but a lot of that was just kind of coordinated with EC Fiber saying, hey, where do you want us to work? We're, we're going to not ignore these, but we're going to prioritize this over this, knowing we're going to miss these dates. So we do that, like I said, right now we're doing these types of calls with two different companies, EC Fiber, one of them, and another company. So there's a lot of collaboration, there's a lot of discussion, and um, I just wanted to just kind of you know, throw that out there as it relates to make ready, timeliness, and transparency, and 
like I mentioned, we're going to go through the whole rulemaking process with the PZ, and um, and we'll come and we'll work with them and be part of that process. Thank you, Jeff. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Karen. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for letting me squeeze in. Yeah, no, well, um, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally and figuratively. I will be brief. Yeah, if you um, could introduce yourself and yes, who you're representing. Yes, Aaron Segrist, Vermont Retail and Brochures Association. Um, in regards to, I think it was H145, um, we have addressed this um, idea of requiring uh, retailers to collect a fee at the time of sale um, for a couple of years now and Chuck and I have um, been on opposite sides for a couple of years now but um, I am here today to request that the committee consider language which I just sent to Sarah that would um, allow for a small seller exemption. Um, this language, language was actually um, drafted by Chuck I believe um, a couple of years ago as something that that we considered but we weren't ready to support it that being said this year I am um, jumping in and saying you know my large retailers they have said that it's not a problem to collect the the fee at the register um, however it's it's the small retailers and you know Northeast Kingdom or um, you know that don't necessarily have the point of sale system to um, collect and maybe keep track of those sales so that they can remit it um, properly. You know, it's it's just an opportunity that we would like for you to consider. Um, I believe the language is, um, I'll find it real quick. It would, uh, a seller who certifies to the commissioner of taxes not, not later than January 15th of any calendar year that fewer than 500 retail sales of prepaid wireless telecommunication services were completed during the prior year. So any any retailer who sold fewer than 500 of these cards would be exempted, given that they would have to apply to be exempted. Yeah, um, so how do your small retailers handle sales tax? Well, I'm sure that they have um, a system already established. Um, but we're look, we're talking about very few sales when it comes to this specific product. Um, so we're just asking for those those retailers, those small retailers, for um, to not have to be required to uh, keep track of one more separate um, line item. If the number of sales is so few, why would it be an extraordinary amount? Work. That's a good question. Um, how do I explain it? What's what's the um, what's the comment? You, you get more done when you're busy, you know. And like when you're when you're in a typical practice, you're you're automatically um, practicing already to collect the sales tax. You know, it's it's something that that you've been doing. It's um, you're probably managing it um, on a weekly basis, maybe sometimes on a daily basis, um, you don't sell that many um, prepaid phone cards. So it's just one more requirement for the retailer to say, oh, by the way, I sold three cards this week. I have to, I have to keep track of that. You know, what happens, um, if, if, if it's one more, one more line item that maybe you're not going in each time and you purchase a, a prepaid phone card and, and making that note that you've sold X amount of phone cards. But they do to keep track of their inventory in terms of prepaid phone cards and such. Well, I would anticipate they would, but um, you know, I grew up in a hardware store where it was pretty much difficult to <laughs> to keep track of, of all of our inventory. You know. Again, it's just the small retailer that we're asking for. I can, I can pretty much anticipate that the majority of the sales are done at, you know, large retailers, Target or Best Buy or Walmart. They have the systems in place to already track that stuff. Laura, just uh, so, 
here in this um, legislation where, because of uh, federal changes, mm -hmm. without this legislation, we're looking at a whole opening up in the existing MSF <coughs> um, from even six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars potentially. Mm -hmm. So it would be helpful if there's any data that you were able to share that could help us understand what we're talking about what in terms is. of the exemption, what yeah. the exemption costs for the smaller retailers. But what that's so called? by them not by them having the exemption, mm -hmm. what would that what would it save them from having to remit yes. to you? Okay. I will do my best to get that information for you. It would be, and maybe it's the inverse. Yeah. That is the way of doing it. So what are your large retailers going to pay in? Yeah. Maybe easier to calculate. <coughs> but let's try that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the language of the exemption is the units you're measuring are cards. Yes. But those cards are variable for right. the dollar value they represent, right, or minutes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and is there a, I don't know, maybe, Chuck, is there an average? I mean, do people buy these in twenty dollar increments or fifty dollar cards or? And just um, similar to what Laura was asking, what what are we looking at in this exemption? Mm -hmm. Representative Chuck Storo here. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, I do know the language that Ms. Seacrest is referencing, and yes, we prepared it. I prepared it. Consulted with my partner who specializes in this area, and um, you know we're willing to have that uh, small solar exemption be part of the bill. Uh, uh, it's up to us. So it's okay with us. And um, but in terms of that specific question, I don't know. I can try and find out. Too. So I actually think this is important information. Um, we're, we're trying to, you know, as, as Laura was saying, we're trying to um, address a, mm -hmm. a, you know, essentially a revenue issue here. And so to carve out an exemption um, addresses the, the, the ultimate function we're trying to sell for. Yep. So it would, it, that really would be helpful. So, no more. Um, presumably the small retailers keep track of some items that are sales tax and some that are tax exempt um, and you know beverage deposits and things like that already is that accurate yes and no it's not just um, it's not just the business owner that's keeping track so what if you have an employee that um, started you know a month ago and over the that first month they've been working there I don't know, they dropped the ball and said, oh, by the way, we need to keep track of X amount of sales based on, or, you know, the number of sales that, that we've seen in the last month. Not every small business in the state has a POS system. Like, they're not, you're not scanning in every product. You're not, you know, um, there are several, several small businesses that are still punching into, you know, like a, an old cash register the cost of each product and that doesn't necessarily itemize or identify every product that is sold so so there's no guarantee that we've got um, everyone tracking the the exact number of sales that that every employee is making so perhaps a better way to ask it uh, are, are those uh, retailers that do not have POS systems manually keeping track of beverage deposits and what items are tax exempt and what are taxed? I can't speak for the those retailers. I would anticipate that they have some type of system down. So yes. they can remit all the taxes. <coughs> the question I've got is, uh, how much does a real ta retailer make on the sale of these cards? And, and is it... Uh, are they basically the smaller ones just doing it as a service to the customer rather than yes. an actual revenue stream that they might? It's, it's a service to, to their customers. I, I don't have the exact number that a retailer I can ask. I can ask some of my small retailers that do sell them, but I don't anticipate they're making a lot of money. Right. It'd be interesting to know, know how much mm -hmm. they can make. Yes, one So, and may I uh, ask? Um, Chuck, actually, a question with regard to when these cards are recharged. Can these cards be recharged? So, can you have um, additional minutes put on them? Yes, I believe so. Okay, and so that when that financial transaction takes place, <coughs> does 
that transaction is taking place with AT and T. Is that right? I believe so. I've never, I'm not, I don't have a personal experience with prepaid, but I, you, know, you can go to the website and you can you know put money on your prepaid account. So and speak. so, because so. the card, uh, the problem with the card, I, if I understand correctly, federally, is that we're asking you to pay, uh, and you're not participating in the financial transaction. Right. When that recharge is happening, are you paying <coughs> the universal service fund? Um, Yes, yes, through the existing method that uh, I discussed earlier with the Public Utilities Commission order basically saying figure out how much of this is attributable to Vermonters, how many send in the money. So, so when it's recharging. Yeah. Yeah. So the only thing is really changing here that we're talking about 145 is the actual sale of the car. The initial, <coughs> the initial sale. Right. right. And I don't know, You, I suspect you the Seagrass may know better than me that if you buy a card at a third party retailer, <coughs> you, perhaps you can go back in and, and give them money to reload the card mm -hmm. as opposed to doing it directly with the. I don't know. I, my understanding is that prepaid cards are just like gift cards. You right. know, like you have to punch in a code every time you, you want more minutes. You've got to go buy a card and punch in another code. So, so I, think the, I think the rechargeable would be mainly online. Like right. If I want more minutes, I can go online and get minutes that way, or I can walk into a, a retailer and I have to buy similar to a gift card where I have to scratch off the back there and put in a, a code. I don't think you take back a card. My understanding is you don't take back a physical card and say, I want to put more money on this. They'll just say, throw it out and buy another one. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I will do my best to get that information for you. That's yeah. what I'll help. Yep. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks for your time.